No, it's working. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. <coughs> um, and for those dialing in, welcome to the uh, <coughs> public board meeting of the Care Quality Commission on the 27th of March. Um, <coughs> we have published all of the papers on the uh, 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 web as usual, uh, but there is a slight change to the agenda format that I'm going to mention in just a moment. Uh, before that, let me deal with the formalities of the meeting, if I could. Um, so firstly, uh, in terms of uh, <coughs> welcoming people, um, we have uh, Prem, Prem Chandran over there. So welcome, Prem. Thank you very much. Um, deputising probably for a number of people in practice, but we have no uh, chief inspectors here today. Um, <coughs> Sianna Aishiru Pinda uh, over in the corner there is representing our networks as uh, usual from the Race Equality Network. So welcome, Z. Thank you. Um, and for those that haven't met, uh, Ibrahim uh, Aligbe recently joined CQC uh, and will be trying to make sense of what we say in the minutes that he recalls from this meeting. So thank you very much indeed. Um, in terms of apologies, uh, we have to Sean O'Kelly, um, unfortunately is still not well, so I'm not able to join us. Uh, and James Bullion um, had a prior commitment at a, an external event today, uh, so wasn't able to join us, but I say uh, others, including Prem, can stand in as necessary. Uh, can I firstly check if there are any conflicts of interest for this meeting? No, thank you very much. Um, is there anything urgent anyone else wants to put on the agenda that uh, we haven't picked up? No, good, thank you very much. Uh, so I did mention uh, an agenda switch. Uh, <coughs> we had proposed uh, later on today to uh, have what was called an LA ICS update. It was paper 3.3. In fact, local authority is, would have been any event or it is going to be covered in other sessions. Uh, the ICS update uh, we won't be covering today. Um, as I think you know, or anyone listening, this is one of those areas of responsibility under the new legislation where the approach we adopt is, uh, has to be signed off, is determined, signed off by ministers, uh, not CQC. Um, it had been our intention to start that work on the 1st of April. Uh, which is why originally the papers were uh, on the, uh, the, on the, available on the website and it was on our agenda for discussion. However, we heard earlier this week that the Minister uh, would like more time to consider the approach. So the consequence of that is the discussions with DHC uh, are continuing as to what that means in practice, uh, but we're not going to be ready to start work on the 1st of April, so it didn't seem sensible to... Uh, discuss something this afternoon that hasn't yet been agreed and signed off by the Minister. Um, we'll keep you updated and we'll also be writing to um, ICVs, ICSs, who might have been expected to start work too, um, and let them know what happens. But I don't think there's, there's much more to say at this stage. Nothing too dramatic, but it just didn't seem sensible having that discussion today. However, um, uh, genuinely, quite coincidentally, uh, we had a meeting this morning and we always consider when we're discussing things in private whether things couldn't be better or more sensible discussed on the public board. And there was one item, which is the progress on our equality objectives and delivery priorities. We thought that was a matter of public interest and debate. Uh, we have, uh, for anyone listening to the webcast, we have actually managed to put the papers for that up. Um, they're available under AOB, should anyone want to see them. Uh, but in terms of the meeting, I'll pick it up on the ICS section, which, as I've already explained, is now not going to happen. So uh, with that, Ian, can I hand over to you? Thank you. Thanks, Ian. <coughs> Thanks, Ian, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I want to kick off and talk about the matters arising from the executive team um, uh, report and kick off and talk about people. Um, there's a number of... Uh, of um, uh, pieces of work that our academy have been have been leading on that I just wanted to to highlight to, to colleagues. Firstly, was the inclusive leadership pathway. Um, that's a that's a, path, a leadership pathway that's been designed for people from ethnic minority and disabled backgrounds, uh, and is part of our overall attempt to make sure that those uh, those individuals have as have the best possible chance of uh, of of thriving in the organisation. 
Uh, we, we recently uh, concluded the programme and 31% of the delegates um, have been promoted, um, which I think is a, a really a really positive uh, story for a number of colleagues. I, I spent some time talking to each of the cohorts. It's a really impressive but group of people. Um, and it's interesting, some people uh, were really keen to be promoted and, and the, 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 the work that they did on the pathway helped them with that. Some people decided to take their careers in different directions, which again was a, was a really, a really positive outcome for those, for those people. So a really good path a really good program and I'm sure we'll be we'll be repeating that with uh, other colleagues other cohorts as well second thing I wanted to draw to people's attention was the successful manager pathway again I think this is this is just a reflection of the fact that we think that that particularly first line managers uh, are a really important group of people in terms of of um, of, of, of the, the work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, this is a pathway which is aimed at all managers uh, at, at a number of different levels and there's a series of cohorts uh, and, and the, really the aim is to, is to focus on supporting managers in the development of culture and to build management competence and consistency right across the organisation. Um, we also got another programme uh, around, around um, inclusive mentoring and again this is this is designed to make sure that leaders at all levels have exposure to people from both ethnic minority uh, ethnic minorities and disability to mean that leaders are able to make better decisions based on on understanding the experiences of of more junior colleagues from a range of different backgrounds um, and then finally, I want to just uh, on this section, just want to talk about the race uh, and inclusion learning. Again, there's another another big program of work that's going on to again on the back of our listening, learning, and responding to concerns review. Uh, we wanted to make sure that that, that as an as an organisation, we were both race and disability competent in the way that we the way the way that we go about our work internally, but also the way that we we consider things externally as well. Um, Updates from the the chief inspectors, as Ian said, there's just two point. There's two issues on the uh, on the report there around local authority assurance and ICS assurance. Ian's covered both of those items, so I won't I won't repeat them. Um, we've got there's also within the within the um, within the paper on pages ten onwards. I think there's some a uh, number of important pieces of work there that that are very much externally facing. I'm conscious that. You know, that sometimes we, we spend a lot of time talking about internal activities at, at, around on the board, uh, but there's a, I just wanted to just remind colleagues there's some really powerful work going on. Uh, local authority assurance we talked about, Regulation 9A uh, and, 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 its, and its companion regulations around things like visiting are re is, is a really important piece of, of work, a really important change to fundamental standards. Nas the National Maternity Programme, where, we've, where we have, have uh, inspected maternity services right across the country, and then there are follow-on pieces of work that, that are aiming to uh, share the learning, share the good practice, um, and, and make a difference, frankly, for women who are, who are using those services, as well as the, the work that PREM leads on urgent and emergency care, where, again, we're, we're trying to use... Uh, it, Try, trying to use the work that we do to identify good practice and then then circulate that back into services that are struggling, creating products that they can use uh, and that, that frontline practitioners can see real value in working with rural colleges and and others. So again, it's a really really important piece of work that does that both provides the public with assurance but also contributes to uh, improvement as well. The I, I, I see t I, <coughs> the independent care, education and treatment reviews, I think that's later on on the agenda as well, but again, it's a really important piece of work. And I also wanted just to touch on the, on the maternity and newborn safety investigation programme. Uh, colleagues from MNSI joined us uh, at the beginning of October, uh, and we've been working hard with them to integrate them within, within our work. They obviously have, a, a, have, to, have to maintain a degree of independence, but I think we've got much more collaborative in the way that we've worked over the last few months. Uh, and, and they currently have 366 uh, uh, investigations in progress. Uh, and I want to want to be starting to think as we as we move out of trying out of our transformation activity, how we can start to integrate them more and start to think from an improvement perspective, how we can start to bring together our maternity inspection program with the work that the MNSI team are doing to, again to make a real difference for 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 women who are using these services. Um, a number of um, number of of, uh, of communications. Uh, 
uh, issues are raised on page 12 and onwards around responding to consultations. Um, the, other, the only thing I really wanted to pick up from that page, uh, page was some really important uh, provider engagement. And we spent a lot of time over the last few weeks looking at uh, talking, talking to providers around the, our new single assessment framework approach. Chris's team have been coordinating uh, the, the contact we've had, uh, identifying the key themes, and then bringing to get providers together in, in, in either in groups, going back to talk to individual individual providers or the representative groups, as well as using the information that we've heard to create blogs uh, and, and other material that we've been publishing on, on our website. That's, a, that's an activity which we will continue. Uh, there's been some real real benefits to, to that, that activity. It's meant that we've made, been able to make some, some changes as we've gone along, and there's a number of changes we've identified we can continue to make, um, and there's some, there is a number, of, a number of issues which we can talk about later on in the agenda around what, we, what we've uh, heard from, from providers. Um, you know, I think that's all I probably wanted to draw out from the, uh, the material at the moment, unless there's questions from colleagues. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Uh, so, any Mark you wanted to add? Thank you. Could I just add? Um, uh, apologies, this wasn't in the report, but I wanted to highlight the uh, accessibility hub that launched yesterday. Um, this is a permanent hub that we've created in in the Stratford office, uh, which uh, showcases a variety of um, technology, assisted technology um, solutions that we've got for colleagues with vision impairment, or hearing impairment, or physical physical disabilities, or or our newest version, colleagues um, really well attended, uh, showcases some of the, the great investment that we've done into accessibility here. And with the successful launch of that, we plan to uh, launch uh, another one in our Newcastle office and also have a portable service that we, uh, we, we continue throughout uh, 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 events and, and training courses that we have. Thanks for mentioning it, Mark. I, I was actually quite often to mention on the AOB because uh, most of the NEDs were here yesterday, and I think well, sorry, all the NEDs were here yesterday. I think most of us had the chance to visit the hub, and I say I was I was very impressed. I mean, as an employer, what we're doing is great, uh, but also the enthusiasm of the uh, the, the um, individual I met running it. I mean, it was just the, the passion she showed to care for the people that we we employ was very impressive. So. I congratulated her. I, I congratulate you or anyone else involved, but well done. I can see my colleagues nodding. Um, any questions? Mark, you're first. Thanks very much. Um, we heard a bit about provider engagement there, and we've obviously got a, an item that goes to employee engagement later on. Can you talk a little bit more about public awareness and what we're doing to take um, the, the, the public with us through this stage? It's a really important point, Mark. <clears throat> there is a strong trust that we, we build and maintain with both providers, people who use services, and, uh, and our own colleagues. Um, through our work, we've, we've re just recently relaunched the, uh, um, uh, the, the, staffs, the, um, the way in which we engage with public groups around Give Feedback on Care. And we've engaged really well with colleagues in Health Watch, but also colleagues in uh, 15 uh, uh, national charities and some other groups. And that, what, that's, what that helps us do is to increase, and you've probably seen that in, the, um, in some of the, the, the papers, the increase in uh, the amount of feedback we're getting from people who use services. And I'm really conscious that it's important that we can, be, we can demonstrate we're acting on that feedback and, uh, and our inspection activity reflects people's concerns. Clearly, uh, the, the, the news this morning uh, of the, the, the Social Attitude Survey of, uh, of Health and Care is, is a cause for concern. I think it's important that we can harness really good uh, good indications of, of where care needs to change, that we can help both providers and, in fact, ICSs uh, change their approach. So we've been engaging um, heavily on the, uh, on the rollout of the single assessment framework. And we've also been engaging with them on particular topics that we want to be able to cover, maternity obviously being one, but we want to look uh, particularly at, at issues around, around cancer, uh, around dementia. Uh, as we approach state of care this year. So there's been really good support so far from organisations uh, that, uh, that represent people who use services. We'll maintain that support as we go into uh, what will be a, a sort of a productive summer and hopefully uh, by the July board we'll be able to show you what that looks like on a regional basis. Thanks, Chris. Steve. 
Thanks, Ian. Um, I just wanted to draw out and strongly welcome what's said on page 10 about the National Maternity Programme, um, because a team of CQC colleagues have devoted huge amounts of time and skill and care and effort to undertaking a, a, a large-scale review of maternity. And uh, I think we're, we're sort of we're wondering, well, how are we going to make sure that as that program comes to an end, we, we learn all of the lessons from that? So it's, it's really good news and very, very welcome that actually there's, there, are quite, there are several different exercises, I think, now going on to make sure that we do draw out the learning of that for frontline delivery staff in providers, for managers in providers, and for our own staff in future inspection and review teams so that... We, we, we don't lose what that team of colleagues have, have won for us, which is a good understanding of sort of risk factors, indicators, what to look for, uh, what good practice looks like, and, and, and all of that, I think, is a very powerful piece of work uh, for improvement in, in this critical service area. Thanks, Stephen. I think I'd, I'd definitely welcome, <coughs> welcome what you've just said. I think there's a number of strands that, that come off this work. Um, the team have, have built up some, uh, some uh, a significant amount of expertise in terms of inspections. Um, the inspections themselves will will lead to follow-on work, particularly where there's there's warning notices or follow-on work required, uh, and that that will be that will move into our normal set of priorities that, that Tyson will will touch on later on, on the agenda. The individuals uh, have also uh, also acquired a number of, of very important skills, and they'll be able to share those with their with their colleagues. Uh, and, and separate to that, we've also got the we were bringing together all of the, those inspection reports uh, to create a, a larger report that, that focuses on improvement, as well as uh, work that, that Chris, Chris, uh, Chris Day and colleagues have been leading around uh, bringing together practitioners to, to learn some of those lessons. So there's a number of, of, of things that are, are coming on the back of, of, that, of the, the work that team have done. But you're absolutely right. It, you know, it, it's a really impressive piece of work. Thank you. And is this a model for uh, things we should be doing elsewhere? I think it is, but you might like to talk about future plans, given the success of it. Mm, I, I think it, it could potentially be a model. I mean, I think I think to Prem is, is, is with us today, and, and I think the work that Prem has done in the past around urgent and emergency care, he's managed to take a number of quality statements from, from the new methodology and overlay them on the, on the work that he's done in the past. That means we can, we can both look for improvement and add regulatory value at the same time. And I think that's the real power of, of the single assessment framework. And I, I think there's, there's some real opportunities to do that sort of pieces of bespoke work quite quickly. Uh, if we if we feel we need to around specific around specific uh, topics, and we know we've we just done a piece of work uh, in Nottinghamshire around mental health services, and again, I think that's raised some questions in our mind around how we might follow that up in in mental health terms. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Any other, David? Ian, I wondered whether there was any. Um, linkage between our programs uh, in terms of our inspections as those are developing and those of others who inspect such as the GMC is there any exchange of pattern of inspections or um, exchange of information about that very much so we have something called an emerging concerns protocol uh, and what that means is if, 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 if a regulator within the Emerging Concerns Protocol group identifies any issue at all, we can trigger the Emerging Concerns Protocol that we then look at our respective regulatory powers and decide whether we might want to, to, take, to take action. Um, and so, so that, that happens as, as a matter of, of routine. It isn't triggered you know, every day, as you might imagine, but I can think of a number of examples where exactly that's happened. Uh, so we may have a, a concern from a, a, a provider point of view. GMC may go in and look at training standards, perhaps for doctors, those sorts of things. So that would give you an example of where that's happened. But that on, a, on a more routine basis, uh, we, will, we, will, we speak to other regulators, other arm's length bodies about their concerns. And, and that, that in, again, feeds into our, our, our thinking on risk. And that indeed may, may trigger a, an inspection in some cases. And Ian, is, a, uh, is it reciprocated or is it? always in one direction oh no absolutely reciprocated so again if our inspectors see, see an issue with a with an individual practitioner then they will they will report that to uh, the GMC so yes there's a there's a well-trodden well-trodden path in each direction 
question of, of detail. You uh, talk about the uh, final guidance on visiting and accompanying care homes, and we, we've talked about that a number of times. We say the final guidance is due to be published in early April, so is, is that stuff of the timing? Yes, on, on track, obviously, um, just going to have final conversations with stakeholders so, it, so it, the people understand it, and it lands well, but on track for, uh, I think, actually for just, just a few days after Easter. Any other questions for Ian? Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Ian. Um, let's move on. We have a session now on the uh, draft business plan measures, something we've discussed quite a bit over the years. Uh, I suppose um, you'll, you'll explain the detail, Kate or Chris, but for taste of fairly significant changes we tried to make to the quality of information that, that the board receives. So this, I think, is a proposal for what we'll see in the future. Um, presumably Steph is going to join us for this. <clears throat> we're not running ahead of time, but we're on time. Maybe that threw her. <laughs> okay. Shall I make Kate, a start? Kate, you want to kick off? Welcome, Steph. Thank you. Um, so, colleagues, what you have in front of you is um, uh, our proposals around uh, how we uh, anticipate measuring the impact of our business plan that's currently in draft. So we've got a business plan uh, that's been worked up. Uh, we've had lots of valuable input from colleagues around the room and colleagues from across the organisation. Um, we will be discussing that with the department and that will be ready to share um, soon. And what we have in front of us is a set of um, proposals about how we measure the impact of that business plan plan on uh, the work that we do and the delivery of our strategy. So without further ado, I will hand over to Steph. Thanks, Kate. Um, so as Kate said, we've been working on our new business plan for the next financial year. And whilst we finalised that internally and with the Department of Health, what we wanted to do was share in draft with board colleagues today and wider colleagues across the organisation how we propose to report on that moving forward. Um, so the question for board today or, or discussion points are just if there's any feedback um, around those metrics and um, just to add that where we've put kind of rag statuses that is just provisional to show what it would look like in our future reporting. And also what we're proposing is that um, as the next board meeting is in May, that would normally be our year end, but what we'll do is bring a year end pack and month one so that you see both this pack and we close the financial year off at the same point as well. The important thing to note is that it's structured in two halves. So it's really important to us around the delivery and outcome of our strategy. So there's something around the performance objectives, which set composite indicators and then are aligned to our strategy. The second half is a balanced scorecard, and that is more around the organisational business delivery, which captures some of the enabling drivers, so around our people, sickness, health and safety metrics, etc. That is really important for us as an organisation. So it's just any comments or feedback, appreciate we have had a number of discussions, so thank you for any that we've already had. So, let's go. Show me, and then Mark. Thanks, uh, Steph and team. I think uh, fantastic work on progressing to where we are, and uh, uh, I know as Neds, we've appreciated the time you've taken to, to work with us on it. Just a couple of uh, sort of remaining points from me. Um, we talk about the volume of, of colleagues speaking up, which is really important, but so is uh, whether or not they felt well heard. Um, and I think if we can look at some kind of, I know the staff survey is annual, but maybe some kind of pulse to give us an indication. Um, in relation to uh, health and safety, welcome those measures. We've got the uh, incidents and accidents. Uh, if in the commentary we could draw out specifically also any riddors that occur, I think that would be, uh, that would be really important. And, uh, and using that commentary, uh, box to really sort of highlight where things are read here and, and sort of the and so that comes with, with the indicators will be really important. But thanks for the work. Thanks, Charlie. And, and absolutely, we'll include those riddles. And, uh, and the intention is that those commentary boxes do not only draw out um, what we want to ensure that board colleagues are aware of, but also any actions, any work we're doing, any projects and impacts as well. Uh, so again, thank you. <coughs> really good progress in terms of uh, both sort of being comprehensive, but also having the simplicity so we can see what really matters here. And I like the, the layout's very good. Uh, 
a couple of additional suggestions. One is, again, just making sure that over time we're seeing whether we're getting leading indicators to indicate that there's actions that we can take versus just lagging indicators to show that we've either hit or missed something. Uh, the other one that sort of strikes me is as we start to get towards measures that can be tracked where there is a prediction or there is a forecast for where we should be, maybe a visual presentation also helps us actually just sort of see where that, what that looks like rather than the numerical one. So maybe a, a thinking about not changing the metrics but saying is there, is there a visual display that sometimes would support some of those key indicators. Uh, and, and the last one is our focus quite rightly is on our strategic priorities in terms of how we advance the, the mission and purpose of the organization. The one that's not called out inside of that, which I think is really critical, and we discuss later in the people report, is our own internal organization and culture. Uh, one of the things that I don't think we're yet measuring underneath uh, culture and people is the, the, the leadership and the executive uh, impact that we're having. We have got a nice statement in there and, and, a, and a metric for line management, but I think actually given the, uh, maybe it's something that we reflect on and close the loop after we've had the conversation about the, the people report, but is there, a, is there a metric that we want to look at in regards to leadership to make sure that we're, we're putting a sharp focus on that? Thanks, Mark. I think it was a recommendation. People are nodding. There's probably not a lot more discussion. Other Mark. Thanks, and then thanks, Steph, because uh, you know we know how much work has gone into this, and we know where we've come from at the at the start on this journey. This is this is really tremendous progress. Um, it, it it will be iterative, and I think it's great that we're just sort of starting with the best that we've got, and some of these measures are not necessarily going to be you know, the ideal me measures. Some of them are, uh, are, you know, quantitative and we want to get to qualitative measures, but we've got to start somewhere. And I, th I think this is, I think this is really great. I, I like the simplicity of this as well. And we've got to be careful as we get to better measures, what we're doing is replacing measures, not adding to something that starts out at a dashboard and then becomes a compendium at the end. That, that would be, that would be unfortunate. Um, I, I'm pleased to see uh, just one one um, sm small thing in, in here, but I'm, I'm pleased to see mandatory training fe featured here. I think that is a a key control for us um, uh, in in terms of the um, the target culture that we're trying to achieve here, and the controls that we're trying to to embed in everyday behaviours. Um, and we don't have good visibility on it, and and so this will help enormously. So thank you. Thanks, Mark. Any other? Just some, two or three really quite detailed points for me, Steph. There's an awful lot of TVC, so I think this is going to be fixed over the next few weeks, but just confirm. There's uh, a few places in here where you talk about improve on 23-24. I think to give the context of that, it'd be helpful to have the 23-24 baseline, because it, it, it when you say increase by 5%, there's always a question mark as to whether does that mean 10 to 15 or 10 to whatever it is, 10 and a half. But nevertheless, the, the, there's a heck of a difference in the achievability or otherwise of an increase depending on your, your starting point. And then on uh, page, well, pages uh, 22 and 23 of our pack, or two and three of your list um, on business processes, um, the, uh, this is shown as being monthly. I just wondered as a matter of practicality, firstly, whether the budget's even phased at that level of detail. Uh, but if it is, whether it's a good use of time measuring monthly. I mean, it's an open question, but uh, an awful lot of these things, I suspect, don't really change much, much by month. Or if there was, um, and the whole point of this, we were going to ask you to comment on change. Almost certainly, if it's only one month, the answer would be, well, it's only one month. <laughs> so <clears throat> I think you may want to look monthly so you can spot trends. Uh, but I would have thought for the board, probably something like quarterly reporting for these would be, be good enough, if the colleagues agree. I, yeah, I, I don't think it, we need to get involved in the detail of monthly, but yeah, I can see why you might. Um, so we're being asked to kind of agree, and uh, you're right, Mark, I mean, made some great points about it, it's iterative, but you know, let's work on the basis of replacement rather than <laughs> additive, undermine a good start by making it too long. Um, <clears throat> But uh, you know, I think if we could um, work on the basis, this is kind of fixed for, for
for this year, uh, minor additions maybe, but we've had an awful lot of discussions on this. I think it'd be great that uh, you'd be very grateful that we don't have further discussions on the principle. But can I also just add my thanks for what's gone in? And I know you've talked to all of us, so I think with that amount of time you've put in. And, uh, you know, I think we're, we're going into 24, 25 in a much better place to be able to measure what's going on than we have been previously. So thank you for that. Um, so I think you've got what you um, need, uh, Kate, uh, Chris, uh, Steph. So thank you very much indeed about that. Um, moving on to the quarterly people report. Kate, I think you're going to lead on it, but we're probably expecting Jackie sort of five minutes ahead of schedule. Hopefully Jackie's around. Okay, I'll start with introductions if that's all right. You happy, Chair? Uh, yeah, Thanks, Star. A few minutes ahead of schedule. Welcome, Jackie. Oh. Um, so, Kate, Jackie, over to you. Fab. Um, so thank you. So we've got three people-focused items that we're going to cover um, now. We're going to start off with um, our regular quarterly people pack. We're then going to talk about our people survey, and then we're going to finish off with an update on our culture plan. So just want to start off with the quarterly um, people update and just want to link the last item uh, to this item and say, um, Mark, we were talking about mandatory training. So you now have mandatory training included in this pack. Um, some of the figures aren't where we would want them to be, but what I would say is that uh, a lot of these, are, uh, the deadline is the end of this financial year, so 31st of March. So, for example, we've got some hot off the, the press um, uh, da data that shows that from middle of March to the 26th of March, a number of these completion rates have gone up by about 18%. So we will continue to uh, monitor this um, because we want to see really good completion of mandatory training as well. But that pack is uh, now included, that data is now included in, in your pack as well. And as we've noted on previous occasions, the pack kind of follows the life cycle of the employee. So where we are with recruitment, how we're doing with vacancy, sickness rates and turnover as well. But without further ado, I'll hand over to Jackie for a couple of headlines and then we'll open up to questions. Great. Thanks, Kate. Um, I think, you know, we've said before this pack is evolving um, and I think, that, you know, any feedback that we'll get, try and incorporate to a point where it keeps the balance that it's not so big that we can't have a good conversation, but it does capture the life cycle um, and the data that we capture centrally. So I pulled out a few things, but obviously I'm sure colleagues will have observations or questions around specific areas. So if we think about recruitment, there's been some really, really busy campaigns and some of the campaigns have seen applications of over 400, um, which is quite unique in terms of the numbers and the number of campaigns. So that is encouraging, but also we're also mindful around the work for colleagues in terms of what that looks like for shortlisting. So my team are thinking about how we can support more. Um, the independent panel member, we're still hitting 100% of representation across um, interviews. And again, looking at when some of the transformation work concludes as to how we can roll that out uh, across other grades. But again, just mindful of the resource um, that we'll need to do that. So, you know, timing is everything with that one. Um, I think linked to, linked to recruitment, I think we'll see the data start to even out and become um, sort of better in quality when we get through transformation and corporate service review. Because at the moment, we have a lot of colleagues who work fixed term contracts. The reason for that was the decision around workforce controls at the start of transformation, that until we knew what structures looked like, um, a big majority of the roles would be offered on a fixed term contract, whether that was held against permanent roles or if it was work that was actually linked into the transformation. As we work through this across the whole organisation, we're seeing colleagues um, take up permanent roles, apply for new roles and be successful with them. And there will be um, some colleagues where their work has come to an end because it was time bound 
and will see them exit the business if they haven't secured <coughs> or taken up, you know, taking the opportunity to, to secure a role. So I think really post June, a lot of the um, exit data um, and the structural data will become more static, as we see colleagues being um, confirmed into into positions. And then the the other area, just wanted to sort of like um, think about, was the support that we're looking at in terms of how we support colleagues who maybe have um, stress um, or long-term um, illnesses. And again, looking at the wellbeing offer, mental health offer, and how I resource that to provide support to um, line managers and leaders. So they were just a few of the things I just wanted to highlight. And I think, you know, the transformation and the structural changes will really impact a, a, a lot of threads that run through our people data as colleagues are confirmed in roles, are confirmed um, into new roles, or the working environment changes and, and they've got clarity, and I think that'll help a lot of the areas um, that are defined in here. Okay, thanks, Jackie. Questions or comments? Shamia. Uh, thanks, Jackie. Uh, I found the report really useful uh, and the, the quality of the data very helpful. Just a few questions if I can. Uh, uh, Kate reflected on mandatory training. I think uh, for me there's some areas that are missing. We need to pick up when we're looking with our policies, whether we've got all the mandatory training we should be having adequately captured. And I think um, getting really clear on, um, you know, on, on the fact it's not acceptable not to get to compliance is really important, particularly when we look at areas such as health and safety, we were at 66, that, that, sh that shouldn't be okay for us as the leaders of the organisation. So I'm glad to hear mandatory training is, is coming along. Uh, the second was uh, a point of clarification around the sickness data. Um, <coughs> there was a chart on page 38 of the diligent pack, um, where if, if I'm correct in reading this, and you, you might uh, clarify for me please that if we work generally a five day week and we're saying that 321 of our people uh, take more than uh, 20 sick days in six months, are we saying that a month in every six we have some people taking sick leave? Yes. We are, okay. Yeah. So that, that's a high sickness for, for certain of our colleagues and I guess I'd, I'd just like to understand what mechanisms we have to look at sick yeah. and how that's being managed by uh, by the managers in the organisation. So I think there's a few things just to reflect in the data. Um, colleagues who have reasonable adjustments can have their um, absence increased by up to 50% of tolerance, which will also be captured in there. And also within that, there is action taken um, in terms of support, understanding the reason for absence at day five, so even though the data, the stock data, there is activity throughout that in terms of absence review meetings, formal absence review meetings, and then, and then beyond. And that obviously is overlaid by the support in terms of the cause of the absence and the support mechanisms we can put in. But happy to share, you know, the key points of the policy that I think talk to each point in our management of absence, because I think, yeah, the, the, the data looks stock, but there's a lot of activity sits behind that. Yeah, I think, and I think coming to terms with that and understanding that, um, you know, the, the causes of sickness and why yes. people are sick um, and, uh, and, and how that's managed is, yeah. is absolutely vital. Um, the, the third point for me was, it was quite stark how many people were leaving our organisation in short order. Um, it could be, as you say, that it's to do with the number of people on fixed term contracts. If, like we've just talked about, some of the sickness is reasonable adjustments, that would be helpful to extract. Yes. Yeah. Likewise, it would be useful for us to understand what proportion of those people, high proportion of people leaving within two years, are on fixed term relative yes. to people who have joined us and have found that culturally we, we're not quite where they would expect us to be, which is what we should be covering and discussing here. Yes, I think the other thing to mention with leavers, which is just specific to the data that we're looking at over the, like the last few months and probably the next few months, is it also includes 
um, redundancies as well. Um, and that will clearly, um, you know, peter off from June onwards. So I think in terms of going forward, I think the data that we'll look at will be the real genuine data of the workforce and not the tail end of transformation. Sorry, and there was one more. I think um, what we see across all the reports that have come through um, is the really important, uh, or the, the value that comes out of triangulating your sources of people data. So we have been lucky enough within this uh, month to see uh, staff's colleague survey results, to see uh, some of the ER environment and uh, some of the sickness results together. And I think when I pulled those together, I think it warrants looking at certain groups such as those with a disability that feature in all three groups and understanding why that might be, because we get quite rich data when we're able to triangulate. So if that one can be picked up by the team, I think that would be beneficial. I think Mark was first. Well, I'm sorry, there's two Marks. Mark, Mark, and David. <laughs> uh, so, so again, th you know, thank you for a great report. Really clear to read as well. Uh, the other one that just sort of stood out was lever diversity with the ethnic minority turnover rate. That one looks like it's quite a lot out of tolerance at 18.4 percent versus an 11.5. Is there any more? Um, Behind that, have we looked into that to see what's driving that, and if there's something that we should, is it a signal, is it a one-off? Sorry, when we've looked into this, this as well talks to the point of transformation, because there was in excess of 20% of ethnic minority colleagues came in for transformation or on fixed-term contracts. So as those fixed term contracts come to an end, we're obviously seeing some leavers, some, some colleagues are still um, waiting to have confirmation of roles. So again, we are tracking that in terms of where we are, but I know that it's been slightly distorted by the prolonged period of fixed term contracts we've had, even if they were against full time roles. Um, it's probably gone on longer than we'd anticipate um, so that I'm saying, you know, the, I think the next pack should see some stability in there in data that we can really critique in terms of what this is telling us and what our action needs to be. There's some areas that's still a bit opaque until we finish the corporate service transformation. So I think, sorry, do you want to use the comment? Thank you. Uh, in terms of recruitment and retention of uh, colleagues of an ethnic minority and those with a disability, the stats here clearly show that there is an issue uh, and that there are stress levels that are quite high leading to uh, sickness absences and invariably that affects uh, staff morale for those colleagues who remain to cover for those who are away and uh, just the overall productivity of the organization goes down. What plans do you have to work with the networks to identify these issues so that we can have a, sort of like a working mechanism to drive up uh, retention of ethnic minorities? You mentioned that during the transformation process, that's where people of ethnic minority, the large numbers came from. If we looked at into the data on why we have the majority of colleagues coming in on short-term fixed contracts rather than permanent roles. So if I, I start at the bottom, so organisationally there was a decision taken to implement work for a workforce control committee and this was as part of the transformation decision. So that actually, until we knew, until we knew structures um, that most colleagues would be offered fixed term contracts um, while, while the new structures were being designed. And like I say, it's probably gone on longer than we would hope. Uh, but in terms of everybody was in that pool in terms of the fixed term um, contract element. So. I think we are seeing now some stability, but we still need to look into it as we go forward to make sure that this isn't a pattern 
um, and this can be at this point some of it assigned to where we are organisationally but I think that's probably going to take another couple of months but actually absolutely we'll be working with the networks and with trade union colleagues on the staff survey data on this data and there are quite a few projects in place around looking at our recruitment offer and how we how we approach that and what we can do differently and more of and all of this will be discussed with um, you know colleagues more broadly to get input because that's the only way it's going to succeed. Thank you for that. And just one final uh, comment: How can you reassure uh, our network members in terms of the listening and learning and responding to, uh, to concerns that uh, due to the poor results of the people survey? Uh, the senior leadership team and the board are actually listening to colleagues in that you are going to make some changes where needed for the organization to move forward. Okay, do you want to come in for us? Yeah, if I may. So thank you so much, Z, for those um, questions. So we absolutely need to keep a really close eye on the number of ethnic minority colleagues leaving the organisation. We have the data that tells us that we've had larger numbers come in on fixed term contracts, be it in technology, data and insight, be it in transformation. But we need to keep a really sharp eye on that. We also need to keep a close eye on, you'll see us where in the pack, um, how we give out rewards, how we recognise colleagues and whether we're making sure we're doing that well across all different groups as well. And then finally, we've got our people de our, our people survey results we haven't yet got it cut by protected characteristics and you'll know from previous surveys this gives us really rich insight into particular challenges or issues different groups of colleagues might be um, experiencing and it plays to uh, Charmian's point that we need to triangulate all of this so um, so that's a really good challenge on, on what we're doing on that front a couple of other bits and then we'll just come back to the people survey um, just talking about reasons for leaving. So obviously some colleagues are leaving fixed term contracts, uh, various other reasons. On page 43 of your pack, so we, we do exit interviews as a matter of course with colleagues leaving the business. And you'll see from the kind of word bubble that there are many reasons why people leave the organisation, but things such as career progression and higher salaries is something that career pro progression is something to celebrate. So think about Ian's earlier comments about uh, colleagues who have been through programmes such as Inclusive Leadership Programme and have gone on and found promotions else elsewhere, which is fantastic. The higher salary benefits, again, that's a theme that comes out when you look at the people survey results as well. So um, again, something that we it's really important we keep a close eye on as to how people are exiting. And then just one final um, additional comment to what Jackie uh, was talking about earlier. It's fantastic that people want to continue to come and work for us in the organisation and we've had a large volumes of people responding to these campaigns. I think it is worth recognising as well as the kind of pressure on managers that also means that there is quite a um, challenge of getting people in in a timely way and we know we've heard many times you know from particularly operational colleagues about the need to, to get in people to recruit people and to get them um, out delivering um, our kind of core business so as well as the review Jackie's doing around recruitment, we also you know, are, are committed to looking at the how timely we can go from uh, advertising, interviewing and getting the person in, in the role. If, it, if you're happy, Z, I think we need to answer that question about how we respond to people survey. I wonder whether we just park it for one more agenda item and we, we cover that off in our comments then. Is that OK? OK, thank you. That's OK, right. So I think Mark Chambers now and then David. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, again, on mandatory training sorry the, the, uh, the you know the headings that we've got here are not don't map to individual policies um, which is fine uh, you know uh, the, the mandatory training is an opportunity to be broader than that and I'm sure things like the information the, the knowledge and information management one covers acceptable use health and safety will cover all the, the key messages but the one I uh, you know, always worry about is dignity at work, and our survey scores that we'll see later on indicate that, um, uh, you, know, you know, things at the top of the list are things that people need help to understand their impact on others. So it's tonality of emails, it's uh, exclu it, it's excluding people from social gatherings, it's it's um, how you know performance management and expectation of workload and 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 stuff like that, which. You know, you really need the training to 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 bring that to life. Uh, we don't have to do it now, but you know, offline it would be good to understand the mapping because I'm not sure that 
anti-bias and fairness looks like the, the closest heading. I haven't done the training for, maybe I did it three years ago, but um, and maybe I should do it again. But the, um, uh, I want to make sure that we've got all the key workplace behavioral policies mapped and appropriately addressed in this mandatory training, because I think we're going to be looking to this in ARAC as being a sort of key control. Okay, can we capture that as a, an action to come back off? Because I think it's a, it's a very good point, Mark. David. Thank you. Uh, Jackie, mine's a methodological question, um, which, which is how do you ensure the validity of the exit interviews? Do you uh, ensure that they're triangulated or what to ensure that um, you know, they're really useful in terms of the learning that we want to take from them? Because, you know, I've, in other organizations, I've just seen it conducted by the immediate line manager or something, someone of that sort, which, which isn't, isn't really authentic. So at the moment, we'll have a two-step approach. So the line manager would initially um, ask for a, a meeting regarding an exit issue, or an exit interview. If the colleague, for whatever reason, didn't want to... Um, discuss the, the reason for exit with their line manager. They could speak to somebody else in the, in the area of the commission. And then I've got a team that would contact um, colleagues after they've left, approximately two weeks after they've left, um, to talk about, because quite often, once, anybody, once a colleague got their reference, they've maybe started a new job, retired, whatever it might be, um, they're often feel freer to speak. So we have an ex a second chance by giving that ex-colleague a call to discuss the reasons for leave and any feedback, you know, in, in a template format. So then we can capture the data. So that's the way we approach it at the moment. So just to help me with that, Jackie, roughly what proportion of people would have that, that second interview? Well, everybody who doesn't... Everybody that doesn't complete um, an exit interview before they leave, we would contact after they've left. Some people we don't get in contact with, and some people, you know, the, 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 the ship's sailed, but we always go to everybody. That's very, that's very helpful. Uh, I, I'll follow it up offline, if I may. Yep. Yeah. Any other questions? Can I just one for me, Jackie, on the... You, in your covering paper, you had an analysis of levers by length of service. And operations, I mean, it's the biggest area, so the numbers are, are always bigger, of course. Uh, but it's interesting how it's um, skewed. I mean, on the one hand, you've got 62 um, only just joined. We touched earlier about people not staying very long. But query, why is that? Um, what, um, what, what can we learn from it? But then also a very big number at the... 10 plus. Now, initially, when I read this, I thought, well, gosh, that's an awful lot of experience going out of the door, and is that a worry, particularly when 8, 6, or 7, and 8, and 9 are high? So, it is a lot of experience. On the other hand, uh, I'm aware that the mo many of our people in operations have had previous careers and might, for example, be the last job. So, it could well be a question that actually quite a bit of this is just people have reached the end of their, uh, you know, coming up to retirement and moving out. So do we have any observations? It's partly for you, but Tyson, I wish to comment because it's been in his area. Uh, what we read into an awful lot going at the beginning and end, um, is it a worry that we're losing so much experience? But, but as a mathematical point, am I correct in thinking that quite a few of the leavers may well be retirees? I don't know who wants to kick off. Maybe I should ask you Shall, shall I pick that up, Ian? Yes, I think, I think your analysis is right. I think those um, there will be a proportion of those who are leaving after a short period of time who will have been on fixed-term contracts. And in some of our um, areas, such as in registration and the NCSE, we have had a lot of people on fixed-term contracts. That's now starting to change. So I'm hoping that data will change. I think at the other end of the scale, you're right, there will be people who have retired. There will be people who... I think these figures will still, still cover some of the compulsory and voluntary, voluntary redundancies as part of the transformation programme and some of those people will have been in the organisation for quite a long time. So I think if we were to look at that data again in 12 months time I would expect to see those, both of those figures go down. 
Well, obviously, I, I mean, <clears throat> just thinking of, uh, I wouldn't want to extrapolate from the two or three people I know, but two or three people I dealt with the organisation are going, actually retiring quite young, but it's because they've got caring responsibilities or, or that sort of thing as well. So there are many drivers. Um, if there are no other questions, well, look, thank you very much indeed for that, um, Jackie. And as been said before, you know, we've said several times today, when looking at the quality of information, it has gone a long way over the last year or so. So uh, thank you for that. Um, but uh, moving on, we've got the uh, people results from the survey. So, uh, <coughs> Kate, do you want to pick this up? And then Jackie, um, we've all read it. Obviously, we're concerned. Um, but we'll go to questions after you. So, thanks, <coughs> thanks, Ian. Um, so, firstly, a big thank you to colleagues for completing the survey. You notice there's a completion rate of 78%, which is a, which is a significant uh, completion rate, and I think it's something which is uh, which is par for the course. Colleagues, colleagues often uh, fill these forms at those sorts of rates, which is really good. But an enormous thank you for taking the time to to fill in the survey. It gives us a level of richness of data, which is really important. I think, as I've said, um, as I said on an in the internet article when we published this to colleagues, I think I'm really disappointed with these these results. I think they um, th there are some there are some bright spots here, but there's also an awful lot to to be concerned about. Um, and I think it is fair to say we are in the middle of significant change. All colleagues are going through significant change. However, I think it is. I don't. I don't think that is the that is the full story. I think simply sort of saying it's change is is too simplistic a way of, of viewing this. Um, whilst I, I recognise that operations colleagues are are in the middle of of the the most significant change in the sense they've moved to new new teams. They've got many of them have got new roles. Uh, they're using new technology and they're using a completely new methodology. Um, I, I think it, it it would be it would be far too simplistic just to write this off as change. There's much more to this, uh, and it, there's much more nuance and subtlety to it uh, than than that. Um, I think it is a I think a reflection of the fact that our people deeply care about what they do. Uh, our people to, our people deeply believe in the, their purpose, and obviously a change of this level of significance unsettles people, and that's that's to be expected. Um, but it, but it is there is a challenge for us as as leaders to to to, to get get people to a place where they are much more comfort much more comfortable much more confident in what they're doing and that they continue to believe in what they're doing uh, as a as a contributor to to our overall purpose. So I think we have seen some improvements with the way that people feel about their day to day experience. There are some there are some uh, big improvements in the relationship between people's managers and the relationship between colleagues. And I think that day to day experience point is is a really is a really important one. Um, and there also I think there's been improvements in the way that people feel that they're treated fairly at work. Uh, and there have been increases in in people in people talking about their health and, and well being and the way they feel that's being that way they're being looked after. Um, but I think it is true to say that people don't feel well enough supported by us as a senior team. Uh, you know, the, there's a sense that, that people don't feel that we are living the values that they would expect us to believe, and that, that definitely gives us significant pause for thought as a senior team. Um, <clears throat> there, are some, there are some improvements in the way that people see the strategic direction of the organisation, which I think is a, is, a, is a positive. I think there's definitely some issues around people being uncertain about some of the details around change, as, as, we've, as we, we've talked about before. But I think that strategic direction point gives us, a, a, I think, a potential opportunity to build on that. People do believe in the direction, in our overall direction of travel. The question is, how do we, how do we get there? Pay, of course, remains a very specific concern. Uh, but again, I think there is a there is a definite difference between people cons people's concerns about pay versus the, the a, 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 they feel better about the wider flexibility offer that, that we offer. I think we've seen that in previous surveys as well. Is people people do value the flexible way in which they're able to to operate here. Um, I think now we're at the, the we're moving towards the end of the transformation program. Uh, the substantial rollouts are now now complete, uh, and we can start to we can start to spe start to use the time that we've now got uh, to work with colleagues to work through the detail of what's in this survey and, and work through what the survey is really is really really telling us. 
one of the important pieces of work that we're doing is refreshing our values and, and, and the way we, we talk about our purpose. There's a set of events that are, are running out from, from uh, later this month uh, over the course of the summer, and there'll be a board paper back, I think it's in the July board, where we'll talk about the results of, of that piece of work. And I, I think in terms of our response to the, the, uh, the survey, I think there are probably two groups of activities that we that that I would uh, in the way I'd, I'd see that response one group of activity I suppose is fairly technical in one sense it's it's about making changes to to systems it's about making changes to processes uh, and addressing some of the tangible things that that uh, that in terms of customs and practice and ways of working and so forth but I think there's probably a more important component to it which is around culture uh, I, I know senior colleagues have spent an awful lot of time uh, meeting meeting groups of of, uh, of colleagues, doing one to one sessions with individuals, talking to them about change, talking to them about what we're doing. But I think what the survey is saying is we need to do even more of that, and we need to have different conversations. We need to recognise that 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 whilst people may broadly agree with what we're trying to achieve here, there are some specific policies and practices which people don't agree with, and have become become real blocks. Uh, one of the things that, that Tyson uh, Tyson wrote out to his team about yesterday was giving uh, operations managers more flexibility in the way that they deploy assessors and inspectors. That has become a, that had become a particularly difficult issue, um, and, and I think what Tyson's sensibly doing now is starting to give a bit more flexibility in certain circumstances. Uh, and over the course of the ne next few months, we'll see how that pans out. Uh, and we may very well find ourselves uh, bringing forward uh, the, the the piece of assessment work we're doing around assessor inspector split over the course of the summer. But that that feels like a, a really important tangible thing where we've listened to what people have said uh, and we've recognised that we need to make make some make make some changes. Um, so I think there's lots of I'm, I'm not going to go into the detail in these opening remarks, but I'm happy to answer questions about about detail or general approach. But I think the general approach really falls into those two streams of work almost around technology, customs and practice, guidance, those sorts of things, which, again, there's a, there's a, there's a straightforward program there. But then the second, I think, more important thing is around how we build uh, and iterate our values. We've got, got activity in place to, to do exactly that. And then there's some, there's some questions for us as an exec team around our visibility, where we go, how we do it, uh, and some of the decisions that were made and how that's perceived. Ian. Thanks, Ian. Jackie, do you want to add anything to that, or do we...? I was just going to add, um, you know, just to reiterate what Ian was saying, you know, the results certainly aren't where we need them to be. But in terms of next steps, um, the uh, demographic and characteristic data is being prepared and should be shared with um, colleague groups next week. And then I think it's around actually triangulating all the data, um, stopping and not jumping in, but thinking about what the next steps are. Um, so we should have all of the data by the end of next week. Okay. Um, before we move to questions, Z, if, if I could impose on you, I know I didn't. You're, you're not here to <laughs> talk specifically about this, but as a member of our you know, staff, one of our colleagues around the table, would you be able to make any observations on, from your perspective? I think I've raised those issues around the recruitment and retention of uh, ethnic minority colleagues and those with disabilities. And uh, in terms of working flexibly, uh, Ian has mentioned a point where colleagues really appreciate the fact that uh, if we are to move forward, there has to be a flexibility. Where things are not working, we work together. And uh, this announcement that Tyson has agreed uh, or proposed that inspectors work flexibly to lead an end-to-end -end assessment uh, to uh, re uh, increase capacity. I think it's a welcome development. And as a network, we are hoping to see more of that interaction where we are talking. And you, you, you rightly highlight that uh, we are tweaking, uh, working on the issues of technology in the other side of the culture. On the other, on the culture side of it, we want our leadership to demonstrate those values that are so dear to so many, such that uh, we do move from a point now where we are now starting to get into a stabilization mode. We have moved from the transformation. Now we want to see it work. 
but also having those uh, that clear commitment and uh, direction from the leadership in terms of culture. Thanks, Ian. Sorry to prevail upon you. I know that's not why we, we you're invited here today. Uh, so the questions. Christine. Thanks, um, <clears throat> um, Ian. I mean, first to acknowledge that I can see there are a number of positives in this survey, and that's really... Um, important but obviously as a board I think we have to be concerned about the, the difficulties that have been expressed. Um, there's two that really concern me. The first one is um, the low number of colleagues who feel that, that their work is directly affecting the quality of care um, because that is our purpose and, and that's you know a real challenge and a concern and the other is the, the one you mentioned already about um, the responsiveness and, and behaviour at, at executive level um, so, I mean, you've talked a little bit about the action that's planned. What we've got really is, is a demotivated staff group, or at least pockets, significant pockets of, of demotivated staff. <clears throat> and I think it's, it's about making sure that, that you will be doing things differently, because clearly what, what we're doing at the moment isn't having the impact that we would hope. Um, and then the other one, which, which relates to the culture and values, and we may discuss it again there, but I just wanted to, to check how visible is the executive team in the culture and values work, because that seems to me absolutely fundamental. It's about the hearts and minds that, that we've been talking about, um, and it seems to me very important that the executive team, you and Kate and, and everybody else, are very, very visible and, and actively engaged. Can I just answer that one specifically? Yes, we are. We're going to all of the sessions. So. And are, are you, how are you leading it? How, how are you showing that you're leading it rather than just going to the sessions? Well, in a range of different ways, but Tyson. I, I was just going to say from that point of view, Christine, we are doing our values workshops at the four conferences, operations conferences we got planned in April and in May. Um, a large number of members of the board, um, I think Ian, both Ians are going to be at all four conferences. A number of you are coming to a number of them. Um, you will actively take part in the workshops, um, so you will be, be helping to shape the values, but also in smaller groups, be able to hear how people are thinking and the way, the way their thoughts are developing. So, so you'll all be very actively involved in that work, and hopefully at those, at those four conferences, as well as in other parts of the organisation. Melinda. Thanks, Shaka. So I'm just looking at the, other, the initial page about the lowest agreement area. And it seems that lots of people think that um, no action will be taken as a result of the survey and that no action was taken as a result of the last survey. So I just wondered if you could... Do you do things like, you know, you said, we did... Um, I just wonder why so many people think that, because, you know, some results are very disappointing, but there's some pockets of really, you know, good results where we've seen good numbers of improvement from the last survey, but still we have a, a large number of people that are very unhappy. So I just wonder if you could talk through... You know the the practicalities of you know when we get the survey and what we actually do as a result of that. Yeah. Um, so, like I say, we'll have all the data by next week, and I do think we need to take a completely different approach to it. Um, we have our equalities networks in the trade unions who are really keen to support us, and I think executive team need to lead on this, and we've already had those conversations. We need to keep the actions visible. There needs to be regular reporting. Um, and we need to keep it to a point where it's not 101 priorities. What are the priorities? We need to socialise those, agree those, and then review them. Um, because what's inspected is respected. And I think we've probably missed some of that. And we've tried different things, so it's, you know, I, I, we've tried different approaches and some of it's reaped rewards, but I think in terms of the visibility and the accountability, I think this is the line in the sand with this particular survey, um, and, and I think there's, there's, there's buy-in to recognise that. Mark, and then, oh, sorry, we'll, we'll take Mark's in the opposite order, so. Mark, Mark and Stephen. Is that okay? Sure. I, I feel I'm jumping ahead here somehow. Uh, just, just a couple of points. I mean, I, I think one, 
as an organization and as a, as a unitary board, we probably have to also acknowledge that we might have, in very good faith, followed the right process about transformation and ended up with an outcome that's still not correct, not right. So, you know, if we've got the wrong outcome, that intellect, you know, that intellectual honesty, but also that emotional honesty to say, with some vulnerability, we've made choices that have ended up with an organization where we really don't want it to be. And we have to take that ownership and that personal commitment to change our behavior so that that can be reflected to the organization and changed through. So I think there's, there's one part there about that, really owning that and being accountable for our own change to make a difference there. Uh, the, the second point was really around there's so much information in this, it's sometimes hard to sort of say how do you triangulate this. Uh, one of the most helpful areas is to sort of think about the majority of people, what motivates them and drives them in a professional perspective is having purpose, autonomy, and mastery. So the purpose piece, I think, without a doubt, plays to the very heart of what we do at CQC, and the greater objective is clear, but it probably is a symptom that we've disconnected people's daily actions from that greater purpose. I don't see any more how what I do day to day contributes to that greater purpose, and I think that's a, a real area of diagnostics. The autonomy is we've introduced a new framework, which is probably feels like the framework is driving the people, and we need to re-emphasize that what we want as an organization is people that demonstrate their professional judgment and use that and use the framework to support that judgment, not the other way around. It's not the, you know, I was making the analogy, I have a car that keeps correcting my lane correction when I'm going across it. I, I really do want to cross the lane, but it tells me I don't, right? And it probably feels a little bit like that. And how do we return that? And the mastery piece is, do I feel like I can grow in this organization and is there room for growth for me? And that might be role descriptions and, and boundaries. But I think those three as orientation for actions might be a very helpful way forward. Thanks, Mark. Mark? Uh, thank you. The, uh, and and uh, you know, it's, it's fantastic and wonderful that our staff have contributed, our colleagues have contributed to this level of participation. 78% participation is strong and it allows us to look at the voice of the organization. Uh, we mustn't betray that by trying to sort of say that this is pockets of feelings around the organization. No, these scores represent us and, the, and, uh, and our organization today. Um, the, the, there's lots to be dis disappointed uh, 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 about in here, um, the, the score that disappointed me most was just about our worst score, which was the one that Belinda referred to about, I think effective action has been taken on the results of the last survey. Nearly half of our people disagreed with that. It was, it was the least positive and it was, it would, almost half of pe people disagreed with that. And the expectations for, um, uh, you know, for next year's uh, survey, what would happen next time is over 50% of people believe nothing will happen in relation to this, that in, in the next time they do this, that it'll be the, it'll, nothing will have changed. Um, that's, uh, th that's really poor, because actually this is one of the very few scores in here that you really can control by taking some action, telling people often and frequently what you've done and, go, and, and taking the time to understand what are the main drivers in relation to this survey and, and addressing them, uh, focusing on a, f on a few things and getting them delivered rather than lots of things and, 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 and not delivering. And I know we had um, a discussion last time we looked at the survey about we're going to do it differently and we did try and do it differently but it hasn't landed. This tells us that that approach hasn't landed. So we've got to do something very different this time. It's got to be um, uh, it's got to be owned around this table. It's got to be delivered around this table, and we've got to make sure it lands. And we've got to communicate it uh, constantly and effectively through through the year. And it really needs to be a very authentic response to to what is a final warning. I would I would I would guess in many respects that 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 culture is not where it needs to be. Steve, and then Charmin. Thanks, Ian. Um, I think my 
starting point on this is is a is a comment in uh, Channel Mode, which I strongly agree with that what we shouldn't do is understand this staff survey as people not wanting change and therefore reacting badly to a big transformation program. Because there is a survey result in here that says the majority, 61% of colleagues, do understand why the organization needs to change. The lowest single survey response is the 15%, just 1-5%, who believe that that change is being effectively implemented. So it's not change per se that people are reacting to, it's their experience of how that change, the transformation program and, and, and the SAF, have, uh, have, have been carried through in the organization. And for me, I think one of the, the big areas we should be looking at in how we respond to this survey is the communication with colleagues that gives them confidence that when they raise concerns about the way the change is being handled, we're hearing that, we're really actively listening to those concerns because they're being brought forward by professional colleagues worried about their own uh, ability to do their jobs well. And there's a quick, clear, good, convincing feedback loop that explains how we are going to respond to those concerns. Not because we can always say yes to each, uh, each concern that any colleague may raise, but overall and in aggregate, I don't think we're yet convincing colleagues that we're really listening carefully to their experience of how this change program is being carried through and responding where we can to make things better. Final point, and I, and I don't think that discussion and that communication loop is just about sort of tasks, procedures, processes, systems and transactions. For me, there's something quite fundamental going on here about colleagues' professional values and their professional identity and whether they feel that under these new arrangements they can carry out with integrity the professional purpose that they came into CQC to, to undertake. So transactions, yes, we've got to make sure that the transactions, the systems, the IT platforms and everything else work well because that's causing a lot of frustration. But I think there's something deeper which is about how we engage with colleagues to make sure that we adapt, adjust our new ways of working so that they can still see professional reward and satisfaction from a job well done in supporting uh, the health and care system to provide good, safe and effective care, which ultimately is why people work here. So it's trying to get that line of sight through the way we respond to this survey back to people's uh, professional purpose in, in being employed at CQC. Thanks, Stephen. Um, Actually, I had a number of comments, but I think my colleagues have made them all, so I'm not going to add much to that. Shamian. Sorry, my turn. Um, one, one further uh, reflection, and that is I think there was quite a strong sense in terms of what our colleagues said around um, satisfaction within the team and potentially directly above them, but that sort of decreased as we talk about increasing uh, levels of seniority in the organisation. And I think one of the things I would like to hear uh, back from the team more on over time is the concept of the difference between leadership and management and I think it's incumbent on everyone in this room to really uh, highlight and articulate what good leadership looks like and how everyone's going to walk that talk and how that's different from from management and I think that was really stark in terms of the results and I think that links into the point Stephen made, which was my other really big observation from the survey results, which is that our colleagues just don't feel heard. And I think we need to challenge ourselves to say, are we saying what we want to say, 
or are we thinking as good leaders about what they need to hear to be successful, what needs to be in place for them to be successful and responding accordingly, which is what leadership is about. So I think it would be great to hear over time what we're going to do to set out our stall as good leaders around the table um, and, and come back with that at some point. I'm not sure. Sorry, Ali. <coughs> Thanks. Um, I also agree with our colleagues. Um, identification of areas that are positive and many areas that are challenging and disappointing. I think one thing that comes up every time we look at these results from our colleagues is the fact that the majority of our staff are remote. And I think this is manifested in some way when we look at bullying, harassment and abuse, or actually the two areas that have been highlighted as most common affecting in approximately one in five of our colleagues relate to email tone and style as the most commonly listed one in criticism. I think these are certainly areas that we should give some focus to specifically as we continue. Thanks. Joy. Thank you. Um, I've, I've looked at the survey, I've looked at it several times, and I have been um, troubled and upset uh, by the results. I think um, I've been here quite a long time in the organisation, so I helped create the values <laughs> of this organisation. Um, so it, it's quite impactful to hear that um, leaders, and particularly the executive team, are not displaying the values. Many of our colleagues feel that that's not the case, um, even though I sometimes feel they like, you know, you can cut through me and they're in there like a strip of rock. Um, but it's what we do as a leadership team that's going to be really important going forward. Um, I've been quite um, shocked by the fact that the purpose we have, the survey says it doesn't relate to the care that people receive. The fact that people uh, don't think it's safe to challenge, so even if we actively went out to try and listen and hear, people, there is a barrier there that we've got to get across so that people feel that they can raise uh, issues with us. And the fact that they feel that there is no change um, as a result of doing the survey. So they might do it again and there might still be no change. Um, I think what they're saying is that the journey has been difficult and the destination is still difficult. Um, and we need to change both of those things uh, and do it really quite quickly. Um, I know as a regulator that when I, when I went out and did um, uh, inspections, uh, if I saw survey scores like this, uh, I, they are so linked, engagement is so linked to leadership and safety, crucially, that those, you know, it's a, there's a straight correlation between how safe is an organisation and what's its leadership like with engagement. So I would say, you know, what would we say about us as an organisation seeing scores like this? So I do think this is um, a watershed moment. Mm -hmm. We have to take it seriously. Um, we need to stop. I don't want to rush to any tick box actions. I think this is about listening and having those conversations um, and trying to work out what it is that matters to people most and acting on it. And being brave enough to have the humility to say, we have got some things wrong, but we need to change really quickly to put them right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Joyce. Uh, no, Kate, you want to? Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for all of those uh, comments. So um, I hosted a call yesterday with 200 managers, and I asked them how they were feeling as they were digesting the results for their area. Quite a lot of uh, differing views, but some strong kind of themes came through, which is don't chalk this up to change. You know that, that dismisses how we feel. This is not this is not about change in itself. Um, some of this is that we don't agree with as aspects of the destination where you are, are leading us to. There was also a real plea to take your time, listen, reflect, and then there were some managers just reflecting on the kind of hurt which we all feel when you read a set of results like this about a service that you uh, are responsible for leading. I think there's such a strong message about you're not listening. So there was a load of activity that happened on the back of the last um, people survey. But as you read through the pages and pages and pages of comments that come back with these um, surveys, there are a couple of really key themes that we can't ignore. And they're, they're not all of people's concerns, but messages around the inspector assessor role, messages around the relationship owner, and messages around um, people's ability to do their job, to understand risk, etc., are loud and clear for a large number of the biggest chunk of our people. 
And I think, um, as Ian said, and uh, the announcement Tyson made yesterday about the ability to do some flex with the inspector assessor role when it comes to exceptional circumstances, I think is helpful. I think it's really important that our organisation knows that we are not wedded to a model if the evidence tells us the model isn't right. So we've... We had an idea, you know, we, we listened to people, we had an idea, we've implemented it, we've now introduced the, the policy and the framework and the technology to support the model come to life with how inspectors and assessors work. But it has to deliver, it has to make us a, a more safer, effective regulator. And I suppose just my main message is we are open to hearing how this is going and we will continue to be open and we are ready to respond and do things differently if that's what the evidence tells us so I think that comment around you're not listening will stay there for as long as people aren't seeing us being ready to respond to what what the evidence is telling us on those two really key issues around the inspector assessor role and the role of relationship owner where again there's more work to be uh, done and just finally as I said at the top of this so um, it is personal and it is upsetting so if you think there are seven of us on the exec team and one of the poorest results are the, the percentage of our people who think the execs reflect the values of the organization so, you know, we need to sit with that. This isn't about, as you say, leaping to results, but that is a real reflection on how our people feel and, and how sad is that. We've got the values work coming up, and I just want to be really clear, the values work isn't how we want to see the behaviour of our people change. The values work is for all of us, so it's about us setting out at every level of the organisation what values we want to see and how that translates to behaviour. So I suppose my only reflection back on the, the, the you know, the... the information about how um, people perceive us as an exec team in terms of uh, displaying the values of the organisation. We are uh, open and receptive as to how we might demonstrate that differently, but also we are in the same group as you all when we think about what the values need to be as the organisation uh, goes forward and what those behaviours need to look like. So I suppose I just wanted to share that we this hits um, and you know we, we want to do everything we can to get this back on track. Thanks, Kate. Davis. Chris is good. Um, I guess building on what Joyce and, and Kate said, I think the overriding emotion for me was sadness. Um, I don't want anybody to be ha unhappy at work, and it's clear that the, the results of the survey said that people are. And I think there is, to Kate's point, um, a fall in trust with us as a team, uh, which is unacceptable. We can't have a, an organisation where the senior leadership isn't trusted. Uh, from my perspective, as Joyce will remember, only a few of us were here when we created the purpose of the organisation almost a decade ago uh, now. Uh, and that had with it a sense of what we were doing for people who use services. And, and whatever we do next, the determination from, from me is that we respond to this in a way that allows people to do the thing that they, they want to do, which is to help call out poor care and drive improvements in services. So we do need to respond to the challenges that lie behind the survey. Like others, I don't want to sort of jump to um, simple solutions, but I think there are some th issues we need to resolve around the practice of how people experience that they, they, they perceive it prevents them from doing a good job. I think there are issues to, to resolve around how we return to services, how we manage risk, how we maintain relationships with providers and with people who use services across an area, uh, and how we provide the right understanding of how services are changing over time. All of this needs to happen, but all of this starts with our ability to listen to colleagues and collectively act on what we've heard. I think there's, there's, a, there's a willingness from us as a group to make sure that whatever we do next, we are able to go back out and live the purpose that we created, say, a decade ago now. And I think we're, there's hopefully what people are hearing is a, is a collective determination, that's what we'll do. Make this last comment, Mark. Um, <clears throat> thank you. I just wanted to echo um, uh, Kate's comments there about the the, 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 the need for us to. Uh, I, I think the way I would describe this is, uh, and certainly thinking about this from a technology perspective, we we need to evolve. Um, and it was always the intention that we would deliver a capability to be able to support the organisation to um, to be able to to operate in a in, in a different way and in, in an enhanced way. But from a technology perspective, from a data and insight perspective, that needs to evolve uh, from, a, from a position that we, we, we get to around, around the, the initial operation. And that, that's actively happening at the moment. Um, you know, Tyson and I are spending lots of time listening to people, getting feedback from inspectors, from assessors and operations managers, and we are 
we are making and we've got a, a body of changes that we're building up from a technology perspective and a ways of working perspective. Um, we have, uh, uh, I spent two days at the end of last week up in Newcastle with, um, uh, with co colleagues from the contact centre working through a, a body of changes that we're doing to enhance things to make it more uh, uh, efficient from a, from a workload perspective and to enhance the experience for colleagues. So I hope that gives a bit of reassurance that we are we're absolutely absolutely listening and absolutely keen to to, to, to move forward and, and, and improve matters for colleagues. Okay. I said last comment, but I'm sure that, okay, Tyson, not exactly the last word, but last comment. Thank you, Ian, and, and very briefly, because I, I just want to align myself to, uh, with what my executive team colleagues have said. Um, the results were really sobering, particularly in my group, and, and, we, and we've had a conversation about that. I really welcome the permission in this room and on the call yesterday that we've got time to reflect about this. There's an awful lot of material, an awful lot of comments, and we're still seeing some of the data at a more granular level. I think the the two big issues for me which have already been picked up is one about people's perception of us as a as a leadership team and about how people like I, like me have been, have been listening um, I want to reflect on that and also worrying is the extent to which people think the changes we've made are getting in the way of them doing the job that they want to do so again all I, all I want to say is I align with all, all the um, comments my colleagues have said I want to reflect on that but I agree we do need to do some changes okay but look Thanks. You ought to draw that uh, to a close. I said my comments, I think, have been picked up by others. I'm not going to attempt to summarise that, but I'd, I'd forgive me a couple of observations. I mean, the uh, I spend more time with the many members of the exec than my LED colleagues, and I can assure you and anyone else listening, uh, this was taken seriously. I mean, people were shocked. They were personally hurt by it. I would hope people didn't make comments with the intention of hurting, but people were personally hurt when I read it. Um, and I think there is a real desire to do something different. The challenge is, is what? Um, the perception is reality here. So people think we didn't respond. We didn't respond. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I know firsthand an awful lot of people have done an awful lot of things. So there's this clear disconnect between an awful lot of activity, because there was, um, and perception that, that things went down. So I think one of the biggest challenges you've got, we've got, is to square that circle of why is it that um, the senior leadership thinks it's listening and is doing things and the people on the ground don't. And I don't have the answer to that, but it seems to me that that's at the heart of, of what's been here. But I do thank you very much indeed for uh, demonstrating the seriousness with which you know, it's taken. Certainly when it, we're still getting the data, so I mean, this is a hot work in progress. Um, <clears throat> but uh, thank you for being so straight in our position. Um, and we'll just have to consider how best to, to bring it back to the board. But you know, I, I think one clear message everyone's taken is we need some process stuff, but by and large, this is not about process. This is about um, behaviours and, and ways of working. So, And you know, as the whole board, I mean, the executive are in the firing line, but you know, it's a unitary board, so uh, we all have some skin in the game in that. Okay, thank you very much indeed. We've run considerably over the allotted time, but I... Um, entirely right that we should um, very serious point, if we dealt with nothing else today it should have been this session um, can we move on to, there are a couple of other things I want to go through before the, the, uh, the break and the next one actually is directly related, you've already talked about the culture plan progress I mean this is really just an update uh, I think for the benefit of the colleagues but Kate do you want to pick this up so this can be um, a really brief uh, and I will hand over to Jackie. So um, part of our plan linked to all the things that we've been talking about, but we were hoping to do anyway at this point in time is, is check back in with colleagues about the values that were established 10 years ago to say, do they still resonate with you? Do they still describe the organisation we want to be with the purpose that we've got? And Jackie and her colleague Darren have been busily arranging many opportunities for lots of our colleagues' voices to have a say on that. So Jackie, do you just want to give a quick update? Yeah. So a lot of this conversation's already been had, but just to summarise. So um, between now and the end of May, we will have had the opportunity to speak to circa 2,600 colleagues the um, values work has been baked into ops conferences and any pre-arranged meetings where possible and we're also looking at some standalone meetings in addition to some virtual conversations for colleagues who can't travel. In addition to that, um, Darren 
is having conversations externally um, to get an external view um, and an external contribution to you know, the existing values and looking forward to our values, um, which obviously will be thread through um, the, the final report. And the conferences are all being supported by board colleagues and executive colleagues. Um, we are also going to have um, several sessions for equality networks, trade union colleagues who may be attending conferences in their substantive role, but also will provide additional opportunity with the lens through um, equality groups and you know trade union relationships. So I think that is in terms of all the planning and we're there or thereabouts with that. To support managers, because you know Joyce and Chris talked about the values 10 years ago, and one thing that resonated with me was this was an ongoing and live conversation, and it went on for several months. We're in a different position because we had offices where we could do visual displays and really have that um, you know, buzz around it. We're going to be a bit more challenged because of the work and demographics, but we'll have to be, think creatively about how we can really encourage the conversation to be fluid um, and to be kept alive. So to start that conversation off, um, managers have had briefing packs to support the conversation and preparation for conferences in their team meetings. Um, we'll have people available if anybody wants to have a conversation in terms of understanding the bigger, bigger picture. And obviously some of the areas we've talked about, the survey, once we get the full, full suite of data, that will form part of the bigger review of our culture and, value, and values work. Um, and I think that's it as far as the current activity. It has felt a lot more alive than it has done for a number of months. So, you know, I'm hoping that colleagues will really embrace the opportunity to be part of this big conversation. Thanks, Jackie. I mean, as a board, we be obviously getting much more engaged when you go a bit further. So that will come later, but this is just uh, spending where we are. So questions? Stephen. Jackie, thank you. Very helpful. Um, the one reflection I would offer you is that I understand why we're using the shorthand of just talk, talking about this as a values exercise. But there is one precious reference in the paper that this is about future values and behaviours. Given the staff survey, yeah. I think it would actually go down like a lead balloon yeah. if this is only about values that just remain words on the page. Yeah. I suspect what colleagues really want to talk about is not just the values, but and then what? Yeah. Yeah. How are we going to make sure that whatever values we light upon, they are then lived? Yeah. The behaviours follow. That f please do yeah. sort of keep, in there. keep that yeah. as a single conversation. Yeah. This shouldn't just be about a set of words that we no. put on a page and call. And them it is in there. It's, it's the behaviours and the link and relationship in there. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah, do you want to comment? Yeah, just absolutely 100 percent, Stephen. This is absolutely about value, about values and behaviours. You know, I may completely make room for the possibility we could end up with the same four headline words, but a fundamentally different set of behaviours that sit underneath it. That could very well be an outcome, or we could end up with an outcome where different words and different behaviours. I, I don't know, but it, for me, the behaviours are absolutely there as well. Um, and I hope, I hope we'll also get into a little bit around how we describe our purpose, which is an, an important sort of subset of this as well. Thank you. Thanks, I agree. Shelby, and then David. <coughs> Just, just a brief one. I think it's really important as you go through the exercise not to lose sight of having congruence between internal brand values and external brand values um, and what, what we expect of, you know, of providers and others we work with. We hold ourselves to the same duties of can, the same kind of value set. Um, so please don't lose sight of, of ensuring that marries up. Well, not least because most of those we regulate their contact with the organisation as the people who filled in our staff survey. So. Uh, David. 
It's a, it's a comment uh, to, to Jackie. Jackie, recently Health Watch, which as you know is a, a committee of the CQC, carried out exactly this exercise. And although, of course, it's a much smaller organization, it still is a distributed organization with 153 um, individual committees. Um, I, I would just you know, offer to share all of that with you because it was a very, very full consultation and very much was driving towards the reality of the behaviors that we expected everyone in the organization, but particularly those that led the organization to demonstrate in their everyday behaviours. And there may be something that you would find of value yeah. in looking no, at. No, that, that would be great. Actually, I'd extend that to anybody who has worked with values, behaviours, culture, work, that you have recognised as being positive outcomes, have worked well, you know, all years in terms of, you know, what has, what, what has been successful, because that really is the ultimate, ultimate end to this. We want to have a good, good experience for all those involved with a purpose at the end. So, you know, ex any discussions, any material, you know, would really welcome that opportunity. Well, could I suggest, if I may, as a follow-up, Jackie, if you contacted Louise Ansari and asked her for that information? I will. Thank you. Joyce. So this gives me the opportunity first to thank one of our colleagues, Amanda Hutchinson, who worked for in the regulator for more than 22 years. Uh, she set up um, Health Watch uh, National, Amanda. She retired uh, just a couple of days ago. Um, and she's going to be a, one, a trustee of many things in her retirement, but a trustee of the National Trust. And she highlighted their values. So I think there's, there's two things for me. One, looking outwards, not just um, about what we do internally, but what do others do um, that works, that's good practice. And secondly, the more active the values are, the better that they become integral to people. So I don't think this exercise, I, certainly it's about values and behaviours, but I don't think this exercise is about trading words. We're not going to swap one set of words from another. If you look at the National Trust, and I'm not, <laughs> I am a National Trust member, but I'm not, I'm not um, advocating that everyone be so. But if you look at it, they, there's really, act, they've got four active statements about make it happen, love people and places, places, welcome everybody, and then a series of things which then it doesn't point to you're not living at our values as an individual. It's a kind of collective, active, we, this is what we do and this is how we behave. So if we could look to learning from it, external, outside sources, but also bringing the best things in, I think that would be really helpful. Yes. Chris, last comment? I think um, I think I agree with that. I think there's a, there's a really interesting point as well about um, how we use insight in a more real-time way to understand any deviation from values and behaviours. So at a, both a local level, but also potentially at a macro level as well, and how we quickly respond to areas of concern that emerge in a more real-time way. I think it was a conversation we had earlier on today, but we, now we're able to, to gather more insights from different sources in a more real-time way, both internally and externally. I think the challenge of, for this is how we use it to respond to some of the, as we set out new cultural norms for what we want to do in, in terms of values and behaviours, how we not only communicate those, but how we, how we uh, respond to challenges to those that we hear through our own insight. Okay, thanks. If there's no other comments, Jackie, thank you for that. We don't progress and look forward to any outcomes uh, in our longer discussion on the board. Thank you. Um, right, if we move on, and for the benefit of anyone who may be listening and dialed in late, uh, just to say that uh, we haven't got the session on RTS update now. I'm not going to repeat why not, but we haven't. Uh, but we have moved in. Uh, looking at the progress on our equality objectives and delivery priorities. Um, and if people dialing and want to look, the papers for that are now sitting under AOB on our website for this meeting. Uh, but Joyce, I think you're picking this one up, is that right? It is, thank you. Um, uh, I also have a, a colleague, Helen Ketcher, who's uh, on the line should we have um, any specific detailed questions. Um, this paper was actually led by Lucy Wilkinson, but she is at a dentist today and she did not want to give up her dental appointment, as you know. Uh, it is an NHS dentist and um, I, I was going to say as rare as hen's teeth, but uh, no pun intended. Um, so if I set the scene a little bit, so under the Equalities Act, um, we have a legal duty as a public sector organisation 
to have um, equality objectives every four years. Um, and this assists us in meeting the, the general uh, public sector duty. And that duty says that we should have due regard to eliminate discrimination, harassment and victimisation, promote um, equality of opportunity and foster good relations between those who share protected characteristics and those who don't. So um, our equality, equality objectives don't cover all the, the um, areas by which we meet that duty, but they really do help us to focus in on how we can actually make our attempts or our, our ways of, of working to meet that duty um, transparent and to provide assurance for the board and others who may want to look at our work. So the paper presents uh, what we did last year, 23-24, uh, and then the priorities that we want to look at in 24 and 25. Um, we have four um, areas that we cover externally, and that's how we amplify the voices of people, how we use data to help us um, uh, respond to equality risk, how we work with others, our partners and stakeholders, so we can improve access, uh, experience and outcomes in health and care services, and how we use our independent voice um, to reduce inequalities. The fifth one is about our workforce, uh, and that we've discussed that earlier because it comes in our quarterly uh, people uh, report. So um, I just wanted to say that though it feels like an annual cycle and it's a four-year programme, assessing inequalities and doing this type of work is really a long-term activity. It takes quite a while to change the agenda um, and move things on uh, in, a, in a different way. So um, the paper highlights the progress we made last year, and you can see um, that we made uh, uh, a great deal of progress, really, in incorporating equality assessments in our single assessment framework, um, using it in our independent voice, like the statements we made on inequalities in our state of care report. Um, the work we did to listen uh, to communities, and we've piloted uh, local outreach where we're talking to people um, f uh, in vulnerable um, areas of communities, but trying to get what, what they, their experience of health and care service is like. Uh, the campaigns we've done, and, uh, and also the research projects that we've done um, on inequalities as well. We do realise, though, that we need to do more uh, as an organisation on equality monitoring. Until we have that, we cannot point to how we protect people from discrimination and bullying, or how we make sure there's equal opportunities, or how we look at um, characteristics, protected characteristics, and the risk and the safety uh, of services uh, for there. So as an organisation, we have to make sure that equality monitoring is something that we can do um, as part of the data we collect and the data we use. We also need to apply um, the work that we do in terms of our research and make it part of our normal practice and we do need to publish more on um, safety where uh, there are equality rate related uh, issues. So the paper also covers our measures of, measures of success and overall they're the same as last year. That doesn't mean nothing has happened uh, in the intervening year. It is actually quite a good thing to be the same because it's such hard work. I told you at the beginning that this is a long-term slog in terms of cultural change and behavioural change and, and quite a lot of um, uh, infrastructure change, not just within our organisations but external as well. To be the same as last year and progressing new priorities is a good thing and actually there are some areas where we've also made um, slight, slight more improvements. Um, this year um, we had a session with the board in November to look at what impact we might make and the board were really clear and it was a really good session as in focus on fewer things so you can be far more impactful um, and integrate that into lots of pieces of work. So we've got th our list of what we want to do in 2024 and 25 based on that focus uh, and they are agreed um, with the people who are leading those areas and they are thought of as being achievable uh, outcomes and activities that we can measure and actually talk about our success um, in the future. We also um, this year have said that the things that have been outstanding for perhaps three, three, the last three years, we really have to like, nail down and complete in this the fourth year. We don't want to carry them over into the next set of equality objectives that we do because those duties that I outlined are serious. We, we all know about making sure that we protect people um, and carrying over things year after year means that we're actually not fulfilling our duties uh, as an organisation. So um, the board are asked to uh, approve the equality objectives, the uh, measures for last year, um, as well as agree the um, objectives that we've set for 24-25. And like I said, I've got Helen Ketcher on the line. Should you ask me uh, really detailed questions uh, uh, about this work, because Lucy Wilkinson is not here. So, Helen, do you wish to add anything? Good afternoon, everyone. No, nothing to answer if I possibly can help. Okay. 
So you want us to um, note the progress we've made and specifically then want us to approve the objectives for the current year. So there's, a, there's a, an approve at the end of this sitting in the papers. So questions or comments? David. Thank you uh, very much indeed, Joyce. Just, just a quick question. Do you really think we're going as fast as we appropriately can with this? It's a very quick question um, with possibly quite a deep answer. I would like to go faster, is my answer. There are some areas that we should um, improve on, uh, particularly about using the voices of people um, and, and the data we collect so that we can have more action on safety, um, equal, equity related safety issues. I'm very encouraged by that, that answer, Joyce. Um, we have round the table quite, quite a lot of colleagues who've been involved in this sort of thing in other organisations and I'm sure would all be delighted to, to help you with um, unblocking things that are in the way or suggesting ways in which it could be speeded up. Thank you. That would be really helpful. <coughs> the mark. Um, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> I'm interested in what you were saying about collecting data from providers, and I just wondered about their capability to provide it, where we're at with that. So I might come to Helen on specific providers, but it's not just providers, it's about people who contact us. So it's, it's like, like give feedback of care, knowing the protected characteristic, if there is a uh, protected characteristic of people who tell us about issues of which they could be very vulnerable. Um, issues uh, would be really helpful so that we could direct our efforts and, and resources. We did do a study um, on general, in general practice um, on um, partners who came from a black and ethnic minority background um, and the study um, showed that we need more information to, to acknowledge if, if there is any regulatory bias but equally um, their ratings, there was, a, there was a correlation between perhaps lower ratings but that was more to do with the fact that they are in areas that perhaps are more underfunded um, and um, are in a city and have communities that need more help. Um, and so they, they had more challenging and difficult circumstances. But it would be really helpful, because as, as a regulator, we want to know that we don't incorporate our own bias. Our workforce is diversifying, as you've seen in the people report, but we need to make sure that we are doing the appropriate thing. So collecting it both from the people who contact us um, and providers is going to be very important. Mark? Thank you. The, uh, it's related to both, um, uh, both, both of your comments. In, in our uh, efforts to move fast on this, which we really should, uh, absolutely we should be able to, to, to get, make sure that we are capturing the right data where we are capturing the data ourselves. What I, I think there's a bit of a danger that we get sucked into solving somebody else's data um, data problem where we're trying to draw on data that has not been captured in an optimal mm. way, and I think that, you know the, the sort of support from round the table to making make, making sure that we're using this to encourage the right data to be captured at source by the right people. I think will be really important. I mean, just to say, as linked a little bit to one of my points, so just pick it up now was the. Uh, if you look at the delivery priorities for the year, one of them is your second objective. But if you look at where we stand at the moment, you've rated it red. So my starting point was going to be, is it realistic to have a priority for the year that we've been trying and it's red? But then you seem to have limited it because of the problems of collecting data from providers. The well, question is, is, that, is it even doable or is it a good use of key resources? Um. It is doable. Um, there is a plan to, to say how do we do it as an organisation. Um, it might not be done all at once, but there, there are way, we've, there's a, a delivery route by which we want to get this done. I do think it's right to limit it, because if the core of our ability to identify um, and then mitigate risk uh, based on protected characteristics, um, having that data that pinpoints that this is where these issues are, is vitally important. You almost, it's, you know, the delay in that means we can ha we have a less impact. So th that's why it's red. Um, and it's, but it, um, in terms of 
how we do it as an organisation. We have a delivery plan. James is not here, but we, we want to take it through his um, strategic uh, oversight committee, um, identify as it has been already identified as one of the priorities with, uh, for that committee, and then they're going to be weighing up um, how we can get this done. So um, there is a route by which we can try and get it done, um, and we'll see what happens as a result of that. Okay. Chris, are you trying to get just to th sort of three things to build to build on that. Um, uh, on, on the practical, um, the Giffy Buckle Care element of this, there's, there's, a, there's a, uh, an improvement we need to make to Giffy Buckle Care to allow us to capture some of the data that will help us to make that that assessment. And that's I think that's the part that Joyce talked about in terms of the, the investment that we need to make in Giffy Buckle Care to make that possible. But, but two of the things that are happening nonetheless. Um, one, we've worked with a number of partners um, who represent different groups that, that, that we really want to try and target f uh, as part of the Give Feedback of Care campaign, and they are helping us to reach into those, those, uh, those communities that we may, we may not normally reach. The second, uh, the second thing, which sort of speaks to the original question about how providers can do this, we're working with National Voices and a number of other partners to try to get um, a link between... Uh, what ICSs and local authorities ask for, and what we ask for. So, in a sense, there's a there's a there's a pincer movement, if you like, on on, on organisations to make sure that they are providing the right information and some practical help and support for those smaller organisations that will find that more challenging. And I think that will help with the. Um, because I think you're right. I think there is a there is a it, it is it is naturally easy for some organisations and naturally harder for others. So the work we're trying to do this work in, in across the across the, the country to sort of help give ICSs a sense of how they can do it, how we can support it. So there's a there's a, a coming together, if you like, of minds about why this matters. Because it matters to an ICS to understand their local population so they can provide the right services as well. So we're trying to do it through those routes as well as ourselves to try and make it make a difference. Thanks, Chris. Ali, were you? Thank you. Um, it's great to see a continued focus on this area and a great amount of work being done over the past year. I agree with the sentiment made earlier about the need to do things faster, and I'd encourage that, that pace of focus goes specifically on um, the outcomes that people get, as well as access and experience. I'd be interested to hear a more on Objective 3 and how we see that evolving over the next two years that this set of objectives is going to run. And in particular, whether we're going to be able to demonstrate that our work has had a direct effect on measurably improving equality of access, experience and outcomes on the sectors we regulate. Um, thank you, Ali. That certainly is linked to our single assessment framework. So, uh, and all those three questions are under the key question of responsive. So, one, we will be doing that for our assessments. But secondly, we will be doing it for, for our um, research and also our campaigns. But I will hand over to Helen, who might have uh, a bit more information. But just on that single assessment framework, so the minute they do it, and the ability now to pull out that data should give us some results quite quickly. Um, and also, the, the variation in different areas, you're, you're going to be able to get you know, what's happening in different parts of the country that we can point to. But Helen, did you want to add to that in terms of the plan around access, experience and outcomes? Yes, thanks, Joyce. The single assessment framework, the new quality statements on equity in access, equity in experience and outcomes, and workforce equality, uh, diversity and inclusion give us a unique opportunity to create a baseline. And we'll be able to measure those across a number of different providers. And in future, once we've got that, we can then target our action in order to show how we've actually, how providers and um, different sectors, perhaps even regions, have improved over time as a result of some of the work that we're undertaking. So it's a great opportunity there. If, may I? May I um, comment on the point around other people's data completeness, or did that answer the question? <laughs> yeah, please do, Helen. Thanks, Joyce. I was just thinking, um, absolutely, Chris's point that we've taken a number of actions, including the targeted campaigns, to make sure that we're amplifying the people's voices who are potentially unheard or historically have been. However, without the equality monitoring piece in give back feedback on care and other, any other point at which people contact us, it's hard for us to say how successful we're being in that space. The point about other people's data completeness, you're right, some providers or many providers struggle with collecting ethnicity data and other types of equality data. So they may not have be able to give a full picture themselves. 
but we can begin to, we do have an action in here about beginning to comment on where, uh, on data completeness itself. So if people are persistently not collecting data, which will help them show whether they're being fair, equal, not discriminating, then that's something we can, can consider to, to comment on too. Okay, thanks. Uh, if there's no other questions, Joyce or Helen, thank you very much indeed for that. So we're being asked to approve the proposed objectives for the current year. Are we happy to do that? Yep, okay, thank you very much indeed. Hello, thank you for joining us. Uh, right, we are running considerably behind time. Um, I'll try and make up some of it a bit later on, but unless it's going to mess up others later, I suggest we do take a comfort break now. Um, if we could keep it to absolutely not more than 10 minutes, a bit of stretch our legs, uh, and then uh, we'll rejoin. Let's try to do it for 10 past four, and we'll go to the uh, SAF update, which is in any event an oral update. Okay, thanks very much. And I'm doing things, I'm not using the mic. Um, <clears throat> right, uh, well, thank you very much for coming back uh, so promptly. The, um, we've got a number of relatively short items, so it would be quite useful if we could try to get through in, in a little under time, so that I know one or two people uh, need to get away for trains, a lot of people are travelling a long way. Um, next thing is we have a, an oral update from Ian on the single assessment framework. There isn't a paper of this, we've actually... Uh, for the purposes of the board, cover quite a lot of the issues in, in other four, but I think a couple of things we do want to make sure we cover today. So I'll ask Ian to pick it up, and then I, I think you want members of your exec to expand. Thanks, Ian. Thank you. Uh, as I said, I think we, as Ian just said, I think we've covered quite a lot of what I was going to say uh, and other items in, in different ways, but I think there are some some uh, important points to, to make. Um, we went live with the uh, the final major release of our registration and enforcement service on the 13th of March, um, and and that's added to the uh, the rollout of the assessment service, which which has gone live over a series of go lives from the end of last year into the early part of this year. As of about half an hour ago, we have got 1,325 assessments that are either completed or in progress, and there are about 10 quality statements per assessment on average, and that number rises to 11 quality statements uh, on average per, per, uh, per assessment in adult social care. So I think you can see that the colleagues are opening up new, asset, new, new quality statements when they need to, uh, and they're, they, they're opening up enough quality statements to, to, to drive re-ratings in some, in some cases, which you know, I know is an important, uh, an important issue for a number of, of providers. Um, the, a lot of work is continuing, and Tyson and, and Mark in particular, I'm sure we'll, ju we'll, we'll talk about this uh, in a second, addressing concerns both internally and externally. We, we've, had, we've had some really important feedback from our colleagues internally, a, a very, very uh, granular feedback, and, and a, a number of things are, are changing as a result of that. Some of that's about fixing specific things in the system, although that's relatively modest in terms of the overall numbers. Most of the things are about working practices, guidance, customs and practice, those sorts of things. Uh, and I know Tyson and Mark just want to say a few words about that in a second. But also we've had some really, really important feedback from, from providers uh, of, of both, both big and small who've talked to us about, about their experiences of, of, of using the single assessment framework. Some people uh, report having a good experience, having, a, having had a good positive relationship with their inspectors. Some people have, have, uh, have asked, asked questions of us, wondered about whether the experience they've had represents a policy change or whether it was just the, the, the um, or whether it was just the, the, uh, what they experienced with a particular inspector and we've been working through some of, of those things. I think if we were to distill down a lot of the provider feedback, I think I think there's a couple of things that that, that stand out in terms of what what's important to them. I think the first one is is providers who are asking the question of how do I get from being a requires improvement provider to to a good provider, uh, and and how do I have my my ratings effectively revalidated? Um, and again, um, Tyson could just talk a little bit about that in terms of our organisational priorities, because um, I think we can we can address that 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 particular concern very clearly, and that really arises from the fact that we have we have since COVID been been uh, operating in a very much a risk informed way. We've been doing more and more sort of more routine work in in recent in recent months, but certainly for an awfully long time we were we were really focused 
focused on on providers that were struggling. We're now in a position where we can start to make some some uh, start to talk talk more openly about our priorities, and then start to give us uh, providers a real sense of when they should expect their service to be uh, to be to be looked at again, and how exactly we'll do that. And the second thing that providers were asking was was uh, was how we're going to manage relationships uh, going forward. We had a program before where individual inspectors would have a, a, a portfolio of relationships that they managed. Some providers really liked that. Some providers did not like that. They felt they wanted to be able to have a, have a broader conversation. That placed an awful lot of pressure on individual inspectors. Many inspectors had very, very high workloads. Uh, and particularly where there was a lot of risk in their portfolio and they had multiple providers that were struggling, uh, they were having to spend an awful lot of time on enforcement work, following up warning notices and so forth, and they felt, felt that was quite difficult. The model we've got now means that risk is now held at a team level, uh, but we do need to make sure that on a very practical level, an individual manager in a care home or in a hospital or wherever, in a hospital service, has got a point of contact, and, and we're, we're going to be doing some work over over April on exactly that point, and Tyson can talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, we are looking, we are recognising that I think um, there's there are there's a need for our own teams to to be much more confident in the in the way they they they, uh, they work with the system. That's not in any way a criticism of any any individual. That's just simply a, a, a reflection of where we are. Um, what we what we've been doing is is moving from the old system to the new system. So there are some colleagues who haven't actually seen an assessment all the way through from planning through to through through to publication, and and that that inevitably means people are 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 a little bit uncomfortable at the moment with where they are. Lots of work is going on in the background in detail with operations managers and 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 super users and other people to give people the support to make them feel more comfortable. Um, and I think for me, it's about you know the. In, in, with, a, with, a, with a methodology that they were familiar with, they were very comfortable using discretion uh, and knew their way around, <coughs> knew the way how to navigate around the system and how to get to an answer. I think people inevitably feel uh, let much less comfortable with the new new methodology. You know, a, a couple of months in, there's a need for people to become more comfortable. So Tyson and, and colleagues are focused on on helping people get to that point, and you can talk about that in, in a minute. A um, number of technical fixes have been completed and rolled out alongside um, alongside changes to regulatory practice. Things like the regulatory practice handbook has been updated with a number of issues, and of course we'll continue to um, to to, um, to to do that. Um, the teams have identified in teams. People have identified changes to screens, changes to reports. Operations managers have seen summary reports and so forth uh, produced, and that 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 activity continues. The fact that we're using a platform means that our data is now in a very structured way. It is relatively easy to make changes to the way that information is rendered or the way information is reported on, uh, and that means that as as new requirements emerge, we we cannot we we can be very much more responsive to that than we've ever been able to do. Um, there have been some some particular issues that have arisen as a consequence of being in a transition period. Um, we, we made a conscious decision to to go live with the assessment ser service in a series of steps, uh, starting in the south of England and working our way our way north. I think that was the right the right thing to do in terms of of making sure we could train people uh, and we could address uh, early 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 issues with the system. However, in doing that, it's meant we had we've had to run two systems at the same time. Uh, that's created inevitably created some confusion uh, in some of our in, with some of our inspectors, but it's also uh, it's created some confusion in some of our providers. Where if you're a large provider group that operates nationally, you will have some of your some of your care homes will be on one method and some will be on a different method, and, and of course that that inevitably creates. Uh, some some level of of confusion and concern. I think one of the key messages that I've been giving to providers when I've been speaking to them is, the single assessment framework is not designed to fundamentally raise the bar or fundamentally change practice. If you're delivering a decent service for the people that you're looking after, and you were doing that yesterday, and you're doing it tomorrow, you should end up in the same place from a ratings point of view. This is not some this is not some deliberate attempt on our part to fundamentally change people's business. Uh, or business model by by regulation. So, um, although some of our language has changed and our approach has changed, you know, there's a really important message to providers. I think around you know, keep doing what you're doing. If you're doing a good job, we'll you know, the new system will recognise it in the same way the old system did. Um, we had some specific specific issues though. I think around notifications on our on our portal. Um, we had um, as as we were as we were using this transition piece, we were using old notification forms into the new system. There was inevitably inevitable 
inevitability of having to do that. But in doing that, that create, that's created some, some challenges. It has exposed the fact that you know, we were doing a lot of manual rework on information that providers were giving us in the past. Uh, by using the system, we're taking a lot of that out. In the long term, that will have enormous benefits for both for providers and for us. But in the short term, that's, that's created some, some, some problems. I, I don't want to just take the opportunity just to say a big thank you to our NCSC colleagues who've been do, doing some sterling work uh, over the last few months. They've, had, they've taken backlogs. They've gone through, gone through notifications. They've looked for where there were challenges and so forth. We, we don't think there, there are ma many, many, ma many major issues within that, that backlog. But a lot of people have worked long hours uh, to, to catch up, and I, I think it's an enormous tribute to that team in the way they've stepped up and, and supported and supported the transition space. Um, there are some there are some uh, some challenges with the with the uh, the new portal, uh, particularly around around email usage. We know that it's really important to providers that they can delegate uh, delegate access to 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 to, pe to uh, people within their service in order to, to create notifications. <coughs> Uh, that's something they were always able to do before. Uh, we had some particular problems with the portal in doing that recently, so we had to roll back that functionality, uh, and I had to apologise to providers when that first went live. We've now got a fix for that, which is currently in test, and I'm expecting that to be to be rolled out to providers in the next week or so. But we are being incredibly cautious about that and and, and retesting with a small group of providers just to make sure that that um, that that actually works. Uh, we are still though having about 300 providers a day are enrolling, so. But that, that, that drumbeat of enrolment is, is, is important. And making the obvious point that not, not every provider needs to put a notification in every day. So you know, this, 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 should, this should and sensibly be a slow burn process over the next month or so. And I think we're on track to, to, to do that. Um, so I think that's all I wanted to say just by way of some of, the, some of the headlines in terms of overall approach. But I know Tyson and, and Mark just want to pick up on some of the specifics that they're working on. Uh, thank, thank you, Ian. Um, yeah, just very briefly, to pick up on three of the things Ian, Ian's talked about, and I think we've covered some of them early, earlier today. The first is the change that we've made to our assessment framework to say that um, in exceptional circumstances, inspectors can now create and lead, in, create and lead in, um, assessments, which includes writing the report. We're going to do that until the end of June to see how, how it goes in terms of how, helping the team to get through their work, and then obviously we will review it after that. The second thing I was going to say is that um, I communicated with my teams yesterday what our priorities for the next business year will be, um, and in the planned um, assessment category, which will account for 70% of our work in this area, um, the first priority will remain high and very high risk uh, services for us to do assessments with, but the second one will be to do with services rated inadequate and or requires improvement, where we will score all quality statements in the key questions rated requires improvement or or inadequate that is in direct response to the feedback that we've been given from our own people and from providers that actually where we do um, do assessments for requires improvement and inadequate services we should open up enough quality statements to re-rate if that's the right thing to do and the final thing I was going to say was on relationship ownership which Ian also covered um, we are going to start rolling out a integrated team um, email address um, we're going to start doing that in early April but we're going to do that internally so that we can work out amongst ourselves how we will make that work so that we know that we're going to pick up all of the information given to us and we'll deal, we'll deal with it in the proper way and I think shortly after that probably going into May we will then roll that out externally and we're looking to put the finishing touches to a new I think more sophisticated approach to managing relationships which will be based on risk um, and that will depend and the risk that, that you may pose as a service will then dictate the seniority and also the frequency of the contact you will have with us and who you'll have that contact with so there'll be much more about this over the coming weeks happy to give an update at the next board, but I think as a direct result of the feedback we've been given, these are some of the adjustments we've been making. Thanks, Tyson. Mark. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, to ju just um, to, to reiterate some of the engagement that we're doing with, with, with colleagues across the organisation, so Tyson and I and, and other colleagues from the programme, from technology, from data and insight, have been spending a lot of time with, um, uh, with colleagues from various different areas, from inspectors, from assessors and operations managers. Um, and we have um, we've had some really helpful feedback from colleagues about how the system's landing, how the regulatory processes are landing, uh, how the ways are working are, are working, and we've taken some of those really constructive ideas, and we've, we, we are working on putting those into a program of work that enables us to plan for continuous improvement. Um, 
I mean, just a particular example of those that came from a meeting that Tyson and I uh, had uh, uh, earlier this week. Um, uh, colleagues have talked about how it is challenging currently to upload evidence and then uh, that takes quite a while to then allocate that to uh, quality statements and we've got a, uh, a change that we're working on right now that will make that really slick and really significantly improve that, that, that piece of work, make it a lot more easy um, uh, for colleagues to enter a piece of evidence and then and tag that in multiple locations and do that very quickly. So. And, and some of the changes that we're doing are, are, are almost immediate. We can make configuration changes to change things like um, uh, work um, uh, work buckets to enable people to triage work, or we can implement standard operating procedures relatively quickly. Others require a change program and 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 work that we will um, put in those uh, in those backlogs of work, and that takes a little while. Although we we will have a regular drumbeat of those changes over the course of the next few weeks, colleagues can expect to see that. Um, and hopefully that will give some some, some assurance about about that change. Um, as I mentioned, um, uh, a number of colleagues were up in, in Newcastle last couple of days uh, of last week, and again we had a really constructive conversation about uh, improvements that improve the way of working for colleagues, uh, improve the efficiency, and, and and help them manage their their, their backlogs of work. Um, <coughs> uh, those changes are all identified, and we'll be implementing those over the course of the next. A uh, few weeks, we'll have those backlogs of continuous improvement for all the other services, for assessment, for registration, for enforcement. So um, that's hopefully something that colleagues can uh, start to see benefit from those over the course of the next few weeks. One of the other things I wanted to mention is this: this is not all about just uh, enhancements and, and, and fixes. The investment that we made in the, the, the platform, the structured data. Um, the, the ecosystem that we have is going to enable us to start to do some really exciting stuff that is going to, uh, 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 I, I think people will really start to see the benefit of that um, in coming months. Uh, uh, one of the things that we are, we've started work on now in partnership with Microsoft is a, uh, what we're calling a regulatory co-pilot. So co-pilot is a suite of AI tools that um, Microsoft have that uh, uh, supports with um, uh, increasing the uh, ability for colleagues to be able to do to do work, drawing on the data and the uh, and the guidance that you have in your organisation. So I think um, I'm really excited to see what comes out of that in the course of the next few weeks and months. Um, you know, using our guidance and data to be able to support colleagues with you know, access to ready information, summarised of our regulatory information, uh, uh, helping boost their, uh, their their quality and improve productivity. <coughs> Thanks, Mark. Well, I mean, a lot of the comments from people, I guess, linked to the much longer discussion we had earlier uh, uh, coming out of the people survey. I mean, it was a fast and furious update of a rapidly moving process. Um, I am conscious of time. Is anybody any questions for uh, Ian, Tyson, or Mark? Prem, and then Z. Well, Prem, Z, and then Stephen. <coughs> Just a quick, actually, the clinical context of this methodology. Ultimately, what we want is whether it will improve the quality of care and also identify poor care. So the three things you look at it actually to see whether there is improvement in clinical outcomes, patient's experience and staff morale. My experience so far talking to external partners and providers and the, these quality statements definitely will make that happen. Uh, and also other things, a um, lot of providers I spoke to was saying that they could do their own uh, self-assessment from this call. They couldn't do that before, so they could do the self-assessment even though their own scoring. Um, so it will actually improve the people, providers engagement by doing this new methodology. As we talked about that earlier on, so self-assessment is the way forward as it pro. Um, Z. Sorry. Uh, I wanted to address Mark about uh, the changes that you are doing to the IT system. I think uh, linking it to our members with protected characteristics, those with a disability and those that time has shown that they are sometimes discriminated against, there is a big issue that I think is taking quite a long time to resolve. So the issue of evidence uploading there's been an outcry from colleagues that it takes a long time to upload evidence. 
why I'm bringing it, although it may appear a minor issue. For those people, colleagues with caring responsibilities, they want to uh, knock off, go home for the day at 3 o'clock. But if it's taking like a couple of hours, three hours to do that, people are not able to do uh, their work. And when you think of our strategy of going into smarter regulation, if you've got systems that frustrate your colleagues, that frustrate workers, we are not able to deliver you know, what, uh, the effective and safe care to people. Stress levels rise, sickness rises, and those who stay behind to do the work are more frustrated. So I think we need a push in, on how you communicate with colleagues. I understand some of them are not quick fixes, but uploading evidence needs a quick fix. Um, I think it's a really good point. And, and uh, uh, being the, uh, the interim exec sponsor for the Carers Equality Network is something that I've, I've, I've been working with colleagues uh, around their, their specific needs, so I completely understand what you're saying. I think specifically on that, if I can answer, uh, quickly, those, those, there are two points around evidence upload. We did have a performance issue uh, around that, which has now been resolved. The issue, I think, that currently exists is around that, the ability to tag quickly evidence against quality statements, which we're, we're working on right now. Um, but I do think, uh, a, a couple of words on ac uh, an accessibility for colleagues, I do think the ability for uh, colleagues to manage their work in, 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 in packages of work does create greater flexibility for, for particularly for carers and I've had uh, that explicitly uh, uh, discussed with the carers equality network that they they see the, the the new way of working as a great opportunity for them to increase the flexibility of the work the way that they can work um, I think uh, the other thing is we are we are working really carefully and the accessibility hub which has just opened is uh, has got colleagues there are working really hard to make sure that we've got an awful lot of software and hardware solutions that support colleagues with their with their accessibility needs around the, the new platforms and, uh, and and I think you know there, there's evidence that, that 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 is a significant improvement on ways of working that we've had before thanks a lot Stephen thanks Ian. Um, I, I think you're right that some of this for me uh, links importantly to the discussion we were having in relation to the staff survey because what I, what I think I've been hearing from colleagues is two clusters of, of issues about their experience of, of the rollout of the SAF. One is very operational. It's about glitches with the technology. It's about systems that don't quite join up sufficiently. And it's a lot to do with just needing training, support, help, coaching, hypercare, just to get used to a whole bundle of new systems, ways of working, uh, and, and, and technologies. I do absolutely believe all of that is fixable with a bit of time and lots of help from Mark and his colleagues. You know, we can, we can fix these sort of operational glitches to get to something that feels for colleagues um, smooth, slick, easy to use. They understand it. It just becomes a new way of working. I do think there's a second set of issues, though, which is more about does this new way of working allow us still fully to use our professional expertise and insight to generate uh, activity that has professional integrity? And again, I'm sure the answer to that is, is yes, it can do all of that for you. I just think there are probably quite a few colleagues out there who are not yet seeing that. It goes particularly to the point Kate made earlier that a lot of this debate and discussion is around the distinction of role between inspector and assessor. But I think there's quite a lot that we need to keep working on with, in discussion with colleagues about how they can use these new systems, ways of working, so that this is still a professionally rewarding place to work with high job satisfaction because they know that they're doing something that has real value for the public. Um, and, and it's trying to get a line of sight as we keep improving, revising, adapting all of these systems. Just keep that in mind. I mean, what, where we really need to get colleagues is a sense that 
this is still a really rewarding place to work because my professional understanding can be fully deployed and I can, I can you know, achieve professional integrity and value in what I'm doing. Sorry. Yeah, can I just come back? I think that's a great point, Stephen. I think, as you say, there's, there's, a, there's a bucket of things that just need fixing. But your professional integrity point is absolutely spot on. I mean, I think in my mind, you know, when we started out on this journey, we had it in mind that we, we could collect the information that we were collecting in a way that would give us insights which we had never had before. And so the, the, although we are effectively collecting and codifying every aspect of each report, our inspectors are still walking through the door and seeing the same things, and, and it, but it, they're now, now, now capturing them in a more codified way. The opportunity that 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 potentially gives us in terms of insight is, is massive. I think that, but as ever, there's this there's this unfortunate point that we are right at the beginning of the of, of the of the process. We haven't primed the pump yet, and I think you know, we do need we do need probably a few hundred more assessments published before we can start to start to uh, create that 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 insight that we would never have had before. And it's one of the conversations that Mark and I are having around you know when can we get something that that does start to demonstrate the real value and I think it does then reconnect people with that professional integrity point but it's absolutely spot on. Okay thanks uh, well thanks very much for the update Ian. Uh, I'm just very conscious we're running way behind now and I'm worried about people getting trains. Uh, some things we will deal with. Uh, Joyce, Martha's rule, I mean I in particular is very keen we had that agenda to discuss there's quite a helpful background paper, but we're not going to, I suspect, do justice and proper discussion today. So would you or others object if we took the update note as read, it gives us something, and then we'll put it on the agenda for the next meeting to have a, a slightly longer discussion. Is that okay? Um, the um, rapid review update. Is Chris going to join us? I think so. <coughs> Hi, Chris. Sorry to keep you waiting. You'll have seen we're running horribly behind schedule now. Um, <clears throat> the, we did circulate a copy of the report, but I don't think many people have had a chance to look at it, so it's very long. I'm not suggesting talk everyone through it. Uh, but, Ian, I don't know if you want to introduce this, and then uh, how do you want to play uh, it? Given the time, I'm going to, I'm, given the time, I'm going to come straight over to Chris, if you just want to use the microphone, Chris. Thank you. I guess it's on. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, uh, thanks, Ian. Um, and thank you for having me this afternoon. I'm just going to give you a quick summary on the rapid review into Nottingham Healthcare NHS Foundation Trust. So a bit of a context uh, following the conviction of Valdo Kalkani, uh, the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care commissioned us to do a rapid review into Nottingham NHS Foundation Trust. There were three main areas she asked us to focus on, a rapid review of the available evidence into care and treatment for Valdo. Second part was to look at patient safety and quality of care provided by the trust. And finally, it was for us to look at an assessment of progress made by Rampton uh, since our last uh, CQC inspection, which was in July 2023. In the report we published yesterday, uh, we are focusing on the first two parts, part two and three, and then later in the summer we will publish a separate report which focuses on part one, which will be talking about the care and treatment for Valdo. Um, uh, so that will be sometime in June 2024. In terms of findings, I'm just going to run through some of the headlines. Um, there were two parts uh, for community mental health services and inpatient services. There was uh, demand for services and access to care. There were some issues around people struggling to access services when they needed those services. The quality of care and treatment across the trust varied. There were some inconsistencies in terms of care planning. Sometimes people were not involved in the care and they were never actually included in planning that care. In terms of staffing, uh, staffing levels did not always meet the demand of the caseload sizes that staff were working towards to, and sometimes they were not even able to respond to the referrals which were coming to, to, to them as part of the services they were providing. Uh, risk assessment and risk uh, management was inconsistent, which increased the risk uh, to people coming to harm. In terms of leadership, 
leadership leaders were aware of the, the risks and issues which were pro within the trust, but action to address those safety concerns was often reactive, and they did not appear to have a, a, a clear oversight of those uh, risks. There was an issue around culture, feedback from staff, uh, showed evidence of bullying and harassment by senior managers towards employees. There were issues around low staffing levels, low staffing morale, increased burnout, and high sickness levels. In Rampton, we saw some signs of improvement since our last inspection in July 2023. There were some improvements in terms of uh, deaf patients who were having great access to staff who were trained in British Sign Language. The availability and provision of therapeutic activities had also improved since our last inspection. And we also saw an increased number of nursing staff on the wards. However, we continue to have concerns across uh, a number of areas within Rampton. Communication between staff and patients was still poor, particularly for those patients who were in long-term segregation. Patient told us that therapeutic activities were being canceled at times. And obviously, there were issues around fiscal health problems. And then finally, we also then took an opportunity as part of this review to do some recommendations. Uh, we made recommendations to national bodies. There were 10 for community mental health services and inpatient services for the trust, seven for Rampton High Secure Hospital, and we also made five recommendations to NHS England. As part of those recommendations, two were specific to NHS England. One was for NHS England to work with DHSC and another one for NHS England to work with DHSC and Royal College of Psychiatrists, and one to work with us as CQC. And we also made two recommendations which were specific to um, CQC. And one of those recommendations is for us to take a greater look into community mental health services within the country, because we think from this review, there are signs that actually there are some concerns across the board within mental health services. So I've we thought actually it would be a good position for us to have a look across the country around community mental health services. So that was part of the review, and I've just given you really a rundown of that. But finally, I just want to say I've been really impressed with the staff who have worked on this review. Uh, I think we were given six weeks to deliver this review, and the staff who have worked on this have been absolutely amazing. And I was just saying to them today, they've defined what is teamwork. And if anyone wanted a definition of teamwork, the staff who have worked on this review have been absolutely amazing. So I'm grateful. I'm talking here myself, but actually there are so many people who have worked on this review, and I'm so grateful. So I'm grateful to those staff and also to the ET for their support in getting us to this position. Thank you very much. Well, certainly, uh, on behalf of the board, to uh, second your comment on the people. I mean, you said that it was uh, interesting to be asked, but it was... Uh, essential to the Secretary of State and others that we delivered a good report on time, and they did. So thanks very much indeed for that from all of us. Um, questions or comments? Belinda. I've, I've got a couple of comments. So the community mental health teams could be anywhere. You know, so there's very common themes out there across the country. So I would support a review of all the community mental health services. But specifically Rampton, that served that hospital as consistently for years and years and years had concerns about staffing levels, overuse of restrictive practices. We've been going in for five years, CQC, rating it requires improvement, inadequate, alternative. I um, don't know which one it is at the moment. And obviously something different has got to happen, hasn't it? Because this has gone on for decades at Rampton Hospital. And I just wonder what you think would be the, our need, is needed to make those key differences at that hospital. But part of our recommendation to Secretary of State, it's around actually the re-license they get, it's supposed to be five years. So every five years they get to be re-licensed to run those services. Our recommendation is for them to be given 12 months with conditions. So the improvements we have seen currently, they have to maintain and sustain those improvements in terms of, for example, staffing levels are up to 85%. And they need to maintain that. They need to maintain activities for patients. They need to make sure British Sign Language staff are working with deaf uh, patients. So, so, so those are the improvements we expect to see. So the 12 months gives us an opportunity to go back in, and we can still make recommendations back 
as part of the update to the Secretary of State before she makes her final decisions. And we've never been in this position before. The second bit is we've asked for another high secure service to be you know, partnered with, uh, with Rampton to provide them with some support in terms of leadership in, in looking at some of the issues. We've also asked for someone to look at culture. We've also asked for someone to look at the staffing levels. We've never been in this position before where we've got actually 12 months to make sure the improvements are taking place. Thanks, Chris. Any other? Go Prem. Just a quick question. I think, you know, I'm totally support. I think you need, it's not you need to, not you, it's everywhere. Um, so, like maternity, emergency, even what we did, and I think you should. So, I totally support you do that. Other things I want to ask is, um, there's a big question about mental health in black and minority community, this one. Do you think there is any option to expand this one to understand that aspect of it from this review? I mean, we, we, before the, the, the Section 48, we've got a priority for regulatory leadership already, which is looking at experience of black men in mental health services. And that's a priority and commitment we have made at CQC. And we, has, we have started doing that work with Rethink Mental Illness to really understand what is the experience of black men in mental health services. We know they are overrepresented. We know they are most likely detained on the uh, Mental Health Act 3.5 times as compared to other ethnic min uh, other um, uh, minority groups. Um, so, so there's something about actually the work we are doing on on, on that uh, experience of black men in mental health. It will obviously give us some intelligence in terms of some of the work we we have seen within within the Section 48 review. Thanks, Chris. Ian. Thanks. I just want to add my voice to Chris's in terms of the, the thanks to uh, the colleagues that have, have been working on this piece of work. And also to thank Chris personally for the, the leadership that he's shown here. I mean, really fantastic piece of work. And I think what's, what's been really interesting about this, I think, is it, it has shown regulatory leadership working very closely with Tyson's group in terms of the people on the ground. Um, whilst also coincidentally rolling out the single assessment framework, it has to be said, Lorraine, uh, Lorraine Tedeschini in the Midlands and, and her team were doing fantastic work, as well as Chris's team in terms of, in terms of communications and, and talking, to, talking to the department and so forth. So this feels like the right sort of model that we, can, we should be doing this again and again as part of, as part of pieces of work. And then just picking up uh, Prem's last point, you know, in my mind, the single assessment framework, the, the quality statements around inequalities are exactly the sorts of things we would assemble as part of an ongoing programme of work. So we'd use the single assessment framework in the way that we used the way we used our, our, our work on maternity. And I see a similar sort of concept of, of a programme of work with a package of quality statements that were particularly focused on the issues that we see. But um, I think it's a really good start. But I think there's a lot more work for us to do in the way that Belinda was describing. Thank you. It looks like there's, uh, we track recommendations of things she could, she should, CQC should do, so obviously we'll put these two on as well. No, that, that will come back. Okay, well, look, Chris, thanks very much indeed. Uh, sorry, we should go and do in a bit rush, but it, since the report was published yesterday, it seemed uh, it would be a huge missed opportunity not to give you an opportunity just to say what you've been doing. So well done. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Um, the ICETR update was last... Um, thing for a significant discussion anyway. Um, <clears throat> I think Rebecca is joining us. Yes, hello Rebecca, I was looking the other way. Um, <clears throat> uh, Tyson, I'm told in Jane's absence you were going to do a quick introduction. Uh, Rebecca, I do apologise keep you waiting but you would have worked out from that we're running badly behind schedule. So uh, <clears throat> it would be nice to keep this to a lot more than the, the lot of 10 minutes if we could. It allowed Tyson to introduce it. Um, we've read the paper so don't need to go through the detail high spots and then we'll take questions. Thanks. Tyson. Thank, thank you, Ian. Welcome, Rebecca. I'll, I'll be very brief. It's c clear from the paper this is a really important piece of work. Um, it was recommended by Bar Baroness Hollins that um, we took it on from the Department of Health and from the NHS, uh, NHS England. We secured some money for this work in December last year, I think it was, and I think Rebecca wants to give the board an update on our progress towards implementation. Yes, thank you, Tyson. Just want to check the speaker uh, was working. Um, yes, yeah, so you've given a bit of background. Thanks, Tyson. I know you would have read the paper. Um, so just to give a little bit of context from, of where this programme of work has come from and why we're leading it with NHS England for the next two years, CQC have been commissioned by Minister Coalfield um, 
through Department of Health and Social Care to deliver the independent care and treatment program for, the, for a two-year period. And this was following Baroness Holland's report and recommendations about the previous running of the ICTR program with uh, Department of Health and NHS England for the last four years. And this was, the ICTR program was actually set up as a result of our out of sight publication uh, published in 2019. Um, so ET and board agreed that CQC could to take on a responsibility uh, if funded by grant and aid. And we have that agreed. And as Tyson has said, we've actually received the funds to commence this work as of December 2023, so last year. <coughs> Um, just to provide some clarity as well, we've provided some definitions of what an independent care and treatment program is and also a care and treatment program is uh, separately. And since December, we've engaged in monthly regional meetings with the ICBs and have a national view of how many people are still waiting in long-term segregation for an independent care and treatment review and also what support they've, they've had in place to support more appropriate placements. And we've seen some good practice in the northwest where we've seen some significant reduction actually in long-term segregation. Moving on to governance, which is really important, we've got agreements in place with the department to meet requirements set out under the memorandum um, of understanding, and we will be reporting quarterly on finance and progress with the programme and any learning from that. And our first assurance meeting was held in March with the department um, this year. In terms of other reporting, we've agreed, that's Department of Health, uh, CQC and NHS England, that we will be able to continue to report on ICTRs annually. And last year we did this in our mental health annual review report and we will continue to do this going forward. Our report this year will uh, reflect Baroness Holland's report and recommendations for CQC and NHS England to jointly run the ICTRs for this two year programme, which has just been published. Um, but I'm really pleased to share that I've had some helpful discussions with Baroness Hollands to shape our thinking of an independent external oversight panel that will be co-chaired by someone with lived experience. And that will be from September 2024. And that will really then enable us to shape our independent voice piece. Um, and I'm really looking at the position of that as very much about positive stories, what worked, what really supports people to get out of long-term segregation, which is obviously the most important thing and why we're doing this. We also have a plan um, of the trajectory of the next two years, um, but where we are so far is that we've successfully recruited to our dedicated posts. So that's the chair posts, Mental Health Act chair posts. We've secured our expert chairs to deliver training and to coach new chairs and we have been able to continue working closely in collaboration with NHS England. Um, and we'll do that through year one. So we then get that, we'll then hand over and carry on working on this independently and lead that model for year two. Um, we've been working with our business architect to agree a short term solution to store data and reporting. Um, and this will be on our current systems on SharePoint. And last but not least, yeah, our priority is very much to support people to move out of long-term segregation into services that support them well in the community with the right staff and the right support and the right relationships. So we're on target to do that. And just to say, in terms of those people waiting for an independent care and treatment review, all of them will have at least one um, in the next 12 months, if not more. That's it for me. So open to any questions. Questions, anyone? Christine, and then the Christine question is the comment. Thank you. Just just to say, I do have an interest. I don't think it's a conflict, but my husband was part of Sheila Collins' um, panel, so um, <clears throat> that has been declared already. But um, I just really wanted to stress the human <coughs> aspect of this, that these are people who are probably having the worst experience of care you could have. And it's really, really important that we do this piece of work. So I thoroughly endorse it. And I really hope that we can have some impact on improvement because we need to see a reduction. I'm glad you said, that, Rebecca, that there is already a reduction. Um, but we really need to see that happening. Absolutely. Thank you for your support. Yeah. I thought you were going to say something, if not. I mean, it is an interesting and a rewarding to do a piece of work with a clear purpose. I mean, we've spent a lot of time debating sometimes when we do work, how can we see the benefits of people? This one, you know, we can see more easily. Can I just ask one quick question? Are, are there any risks that we, um, to, to our ability to do this? I mean, 
<coughs> hopefully not, but, but are we set up to be able to complete everything in time, or are there any risks that you haven't articulated that might make it difficult for us? Um, I think we are, we are set up to deliver, because we're working alongside NHS England in the first year, um, and the methodology that's been used, we are adjusting and adapting to make it, um, to improve that through the learning that's happened through the last uh, phases. So yes, we are set up. We've got a trajectory over the next 12 months in terms of the number of panels that we will stand up. Um, and as I said, we will be looking to complete those within the year um, for at least you know, one per person at least. Some people might want more than one independent care and treatment review, and so we will be able to do that as well. And then if there are more people in year two, obviously we'll be, we'll be able to continue that. So yes, we are absolutely set up for that. Um, would it be your intention... <coughs> Uh, this is a loaded question, isn't it? Would it be your intention that when you've done this, not only we know what happened to a number of people, but we'd have some thoughts that we've learned from looking at it that, that you know, bring about some changes that would stop this volume happening again? Absolutely. Um, I think the point is the independent voice piece. So in terms of our, our independent oversight panel that we're going to have, external panel, I'm really looking for that panel to be able to really pull out the themes and trends from the work and the program but also like I say to look at the good practice and really see what good looks like and I think alongside that in terms of our powers to assess uh, local authorities, ICBs, um, we will be able to want, we want to shape the market to really think about what does the right support at the right time look like for individuals that need it. Um, so um, yes absolutely 100%. Great thank you. So, there's not that other question. So, Rebecca, thank you very much indeed for uh, joining us. Tyson for standing up for James. Appreciate it. Thank we you. look forward to the work continuing. Um, right, a few last items. Uh, Charmian, um, an update from your last, well, the last, your first uh, committee meeting. Thanks, Ian. Um, so, uh, the update has been um, put into a new format where we will uh, bring to the board matters that have been reviewed by the committee. We'll be looking for approval, matters approved or endorsed by the committee, and matters we've discussed that may be of interest. Two items uh, were brought today uh, to the board uh, that were reviewed by the committee that, that have been uh, brought to the board for approval. One was the annual report and accounts for the 22-23 year. Um, that approval was subject to success, successful completion of the audit, which rely, relies on the final provision of the LGPS information. Uh, the board have, uh, uh, have granted that approval, um, and obviously, as accounting officer, uh, Ian will uh, finalise the, uh, the last remaining matters. Um, we also uh, today discussed the counter-fraud policy and strategy, which was approved by the board. Uh, the uh, the ERIC also looked at the, um, the the plan in place, the action plan in place uh, for this year as, as how that sits in relation to the strategy uh, and looked at the cases of fraud, breaches and irregularities. There are a number of matters uh, that we approved or endorsed at the committee, uh, just to pull a couple out in the interests of time. Um, we are moving from PWC to GIA as our uh, internal auditor. Uh, we approved the proposed uh, internal audit plan, uh, which has uh, 16 audits on it uh, next year. Uh, that work was done uh, with GIA looking at our strategic risks, the major controls in place, the government's new uh, risk control framework, uh, and consulting stakeholders. Um, so the plan uh, is very comprehensive. We also looked at uh, we also approved the Internal Audit Charter uh, and the Memorandum of Understanding. Uh, in terms of um, management assurance, uh, clearly in 2021 the government functional standards came into place. The team have done a lot of work uh, on those functional standards in terms of looking at the assurances but also continuous improvement. Um, it was proposed by the executive and endorsed by the committee that uh, the previous system of uh, Ian gaining um, management assurance in his capacity as accounting officer, that we move away from that in favour of um, focusing heavily on the functional standards and the new assurance framework. So the, uh, the ARAC uh, endorsed that proposal. Um, in terms of other matters uh, discussed or considered by the committee, uh, I would probably just uh, pull out in the interest of time the work that the team uh, is doing on the corporate risk register and the progress that's being made in that area. 
uh, with the new risk manager in place, we're seeing significant progress. Uh, a number of the risks that were outside tolerance have moved into tolerance. A lot of work is going on in terms of looking at the adequacy of controls and what controls can be put in place uh, and the mitigating actions there. We were very um, uh, pleased to see the work that had gone on uh, by the team in terms of a new risk they've identified in terms of transitioning effectively and safely to new ways of working, uh, considerable focus on the key themes, the drivers of risks and then the controls that are being put in place. So the, uh, the committee were very encouraged by that work. Um, I think that in the interest of time, um, I'll just take any uh, remaining questions uh, from around the table. That's a pretty comprehensive summary, Charmian. Thank you. Any questions, Charmian? No? Okay. Um, then a, a few last things. We've got the minutes uh, of the last meeting. They were circulated before. Uh, any comments? Can we take them as approved? Sorry. Approved. Thank you. Uh, there's the matter arising. Uh, there are only two on the log. Uh, both are due to come to the board in the future, so they're both on track, I believe. So I have no comments there. Ian. Um, sorry, Joyce. I just comment on uh, point two about the Ofsted report. Um, it is about uh, providers' experience and the changes in our operational group. So the action will be with uh, Chris Day and Tyson Heppel. Uh, okay, we can switch that. I mean, I, I don't want to engineer it, but I think it was just that we we had a long discussion about the implications of Ofsted on us, and I think what's come out, or we discussed then, to be fair, we've seen examples, is that the, the, the sheer existence of the, the awful Ruth Perry case have brought people, made people focus on the consequences of the stress you get under being regulated. And I mean, we talked specifically about uh, adult social care providers, but I mean, it's been raised by, by the NHS as well. So this was just to say, uh, we're doing, we agreed a lot in turn, including training of all of our people, just we should check in there to say, are we actually seeing any change in experience or behaviour? I mean, obviously, quite separately, but we'll need to pick it up, is the consultation of Ofsted is doing and what comes out of that. A separate matter, but it will come back to the agenda. Um, the, um, there were a couple of, about three items on board committee membership. Just for the record, we should uh, ensure are approved. So I'll just take them collectively. I've mentioned them before, so hopefully uh, people are aware. Um, Charmian joined us and now chairs the ARAC, but it's all seemed very sensible that the ARAC chair should also be on the RGC. So my first proposal is that we appoint her as an RGC member. Uh, <coughs> the second is uh, Mark Chakravarti joined us last June. Um, he hasn't been able to make some of the earlier ARAC meetings, but as a result of transition from other roles, but we are proposing that given his background and experience, he should join the ARAC. Uh, and thirdly, um, it's not so much a new approval, uh, but a year or so ago, we found ourselves in a position uh, after the previous audit committee chair left, and obviously we had a gap of about 14 months before one departing and Charmin's appointment, um, that previously the... Uh, uh, freedom to speak up responsibilities have been with the ARAC chair and we looked at that and Stephen kindly offered to, to take it up which he's done um, over the last year or so. So the question we had to ask ourselves was well, now we've got an ARAC chair on the board, should you switch it back? And, and I've talked to Stephen and Charmian and the proposal is we don't change, uh, Stephen is going to continue, people do talk to him. Uh, I think it would be unnecessary, apart from the fact that Stephen's doing a good job, unnecessarily disruptive at a time when this is important to start changing faces again. So it, it's really a reaffirmation that uh, we'd like uh, him to continue that role. Although obviously, as necessary, we'll need to liaise closely with, uh, with Charmian. Uh, when double-checking how this is said, I have to say we found that the documentation of Stephen's role on the intranet was perhaps not what it should be, but which I, I've asked the Secretariat to look at. That's a separate issue, though. Uh, so recommendations around those two appointments, the new ones, some reaffirmation, kind of everyone's agreement to that. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so any other business from people? Thank you. Room? No, it does not like it. Um, we, uh, that closes the meeting. We usually or often have questions from members of the public at this stage, but in fact we've had none submitted this time, so there are no further questions. So on that, uh, for those listening in, thank you very much for joining us. We'll see you in a couple of months' time.